Okay. Good evening, everybody. I will call the meeting to order at uh, 6.31 p.m. We uh, have a full uh, forum and nobody here remotely, so very good. And uh, <clears throat> I'll start by going over a couple of the uh, logistics of the meeting. Uh, anyone who is uh, appearing and wishing to participate remotely, we would ask you to uh, indicate change your name display to your first and last name on the screen so we know who we're talking to um, throughout the meeting. If anyone wishes to address the council, we would ask you to be, uh, you need to be recognized by the chair and from then we would ask you to limit your uh, comments to three minutes and uh, we will have assistance from Ms. Prim to uh, keep keep track of time. And Evelyn, if you want, we now have uh, have the cards. So you, you can have them if you want. But, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. And I think that's uh, pretty much it. Um, is uh, next item is to approve the agenda. Is everybody happy with the agenda or are there any suggested changes? Okay. All right. Um, next up, we have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any uh, topic that is not on tonight's agenda. We will um, take uh, comments from people here in the room and also from people participating uh, remotely. But uh, we'll start with uh, with a recognition. Is that is that you, Pittman? How's this? Is that better? Nope. Is it is got it? Nope. Could it be you, Bill? Try this. Okay. Oh, we may be in, in business now. I see. Okay. Well, we'll. I'll leave you to work on that. And that you want to. Kick this off. Yeah. Do you want me? Okay. I think that's you. I think it is me. Yes. Um, we have we have someone to recognize. I would ask uh, Donna to step up. Uh, I'm just quoting that. I have one. <laughs> <laughs> <Do you want? laughs> um, well, it's okay. Answer. Sort of. What I'm here to say is that uh, a couple of weeks ago, when you weren't able, able to be here, the, the council uh, passed a proclamation to of, of appreciate appreciation for your 10 years of service on the council and years of service to the city before that. And uh, <clears throat> your work has been, was great the entire time you were here, and we all really appreciate everything you've done. And so what we have for you are a couple of things. We have the framed proclamation and your oh, name plate. Oh. <laughs> it's the most important thing of all. It is, and it is. the key to the city. <laughs> send a thank you round to all of you a couple of weeks ago when I thought this might happen and I'm not be here. But I just have to emphasize it's been wonderful and that all of you should take advantage of the city staff because they're the team member that constantly is here. And all my years at the council, every year somebody changed. I've been through three mayors, but the constant is the staff. And if you don't know it, ask them and read what they send you because that's your team. So thank you very much. All right. Is there anybody in the room who's seeking to be uh, recognized? 
and I'm not seeing anybody on Zoom who's seeking to be recognized either. So we can move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the consent agenda. Is there uh, a motion? Is there, is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Next up, we're to item six. FEMA, building repair and flood resistancy, resiliency, Stevens and Associates. I think we have some people here in the room to talk, tell us about that. Thank you. Can I enable screen share? Thanks. We'll share that microphone. Yes. Okay. And Bill, do you have anything to kick this off before we go? Sure. Yeah. You know, though Kelly's actually leading this project, so I don't want to steal too much of her thunder. But uh, as you may recall, we had a flood last summer, and this building and the fire station, to a lesser extent, the uh, police station, were pretty substantially damaged. And as part of the FEMA process to obtain funding to uh, rebuild them, uh, we had to engage a consultant, in this case, Stevenson Associates, and they're going to tell us a lot more about it, to study the buildings, look at what is possible, what isn't possible, and what are some of the options uh, for uh, moving forward. Tonight, they're here to present sort of their findings of alternatives. You're not being asked to make a decision tonight. It's really to see what's what might happen, what questions you have, any feedback that you have, uh, and then we will take it back and you know, come back with a more formal recommendation based on your input and your questions and comments. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to, I was going to say Kelly, but maybe I'll just turn it right over to the folks from Stevens. So we won't skip the middle person. There we go. I miss anything? Okay. And this doesn't go to FEMA in its present form? This does not go to FEMA in its present form, though. There'll be a final. This is, this is for us. Great. I'm just gonna find the page up and page down first. That's what I tried. Clicking the presentation. Yeah, click on it. There we go. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Council, for having us tonight. My name is Corey Frizee. I'm a principal with Stevens and Associates, and I'm here with two of my colleagues to present our work on the City of Montpelier buildings. Flood repair and resiliency. Um, I want to. Uh, two colleagues here are Mark Herb Kurzman, our director of architecture, and Bob Stevens, the president of Stevens and Associates, has joined us online, and he'll be speaking in a little bit. Um, we're all set for that as well, right? Okay, great. Um, so, we want to thank the committee first of all. Um, they've met with us every two to three weeks over the past many months. And they've been extremely helpful with providing us with information, history, context regarding the project, and providing us feedback on our work along the way. Um, we'll do our best to give you a concise summary over the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, there's a lot of, that we've done in the last five or six months, um, but we'll try and just spend about 15 minutes summarizing things and hopefully have a dialogue and answer some questions for you. Um, I'll talk briefly to the purpose of the project. Mark's gonna review the alternatives that we have included in the report and are bringing to you. And Bob will speak to the costs, risks, and funding options for the project. Um, we were hired for an RFP last November to investigate options for flood mitigation to three city buildings, the city hall, fire station, and police department. Um, there were two main elements of this study. The first was repair in kind work. And what that means is to return the spaces to their pre-flood condition, but with no improvement for flooding. 
And that's a necessary step because it creates the baseline for FEMA funding. And then the second major element, which we spent the majority of our work on, was to look for potential viable alternatives for flood mitigation. And that led to a bunch of options that we explored and investigated, talked with the committee about, and then ultimately are bringing forth the alternatives that Mark will review. Um, next steps would be to get guidance from the city council and the committee, and we anticipate on, on, sorry, on a preferred alternative. And we would anticipate working with you and the committee on that preferred alternative, back and forth, we imagine. Um, and then we would revise that report and that report could be used to submit to FEMA to confirm the funding, okay? Just, just for the council's um, information, I think you probably figured this out, but the committee he's referring to is the staff committee. So it's led by Kelly, includes Chris Lumbra and uh, police chief, fire chief, DPW director, so those, that group. So it's not a citizens committee, but it's a, a staff, yeah. staff group yeah. that is engaged with these buildings. Yeah. And then you're the representing the citizen. Thanks, Bill. Um, one miscellaneous item to touch on quickly before I turn it over to Mark, um, the status of asbestos. Um, we did do a hazardous material assessment of the three buildings. Um, and with regards to has, uh, asbestos, excuse me. So the police department was built in 2000, I believe. And so it's new enough that it was assumed that there's no asbestos materials in there. There were asbestos materials found in both the fire department and city hall. And so the recommendation and the standard for dealing with those materials is that they would be removed as part of the renovation projects. So um, the city does need to plan for that. Um, and the appropriate contractors with the certifications to handle asbestos would be needed. Um, but that would just wrap in, we would anticipate, and the recommendation from the hazardous material consultant is to wrap that into the renovation project. And are those costs included in what you've given us? They are not. They okay. came in late. We have those costs that we can share with you. Um, okay. 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 Thank you. Mark. Uh, good evening. Um, I talk a lot, so I wrote these down so I could read them. <laughs> so I wouldn't talk too much and we'll try to stay on a schedule with this. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to present this uh, this summary information about the alternative studies uh, we have investigated. There's really quite a bit of detail in these concept diagrams and notes uh, for each of the alternatives. And so suffice to say, we're not going to get into uh, every point in this discussion. However, I I'm going to try to highlight a few pertinent facts uh, for each approach to help inform a potential uh, direction for this council to consider going forward. Uh, I'll also say this, um, is these diagrams you're going to see here are not the diagrams from the study. These are reference plans I'm going to show right now for each of the respective buildings, just so we can kind of look at things and you can have something to, to refer to. Again, the detail and the recommendations are in the other graphic report, which uh, you have uh, available to you. So we're going to... Um, we're going to start. I'm going to refer to alternatives that, uh, as they're as they're mentioned in the report, so the public may not know this without looking at at, at the copies that might be available. But uh, so uh, just understand that. Um, we're going to start with City Hall as the primary building, uh, which is affected most impacted by uh, the floods. And in, in what we call uh, alternate one A. Uh, and by the way, this is a plan. Oh, sorry, this is a plan of the City Hall, just uh, the main floor of the uh, of the city, oh, I'm sorry, it's the basement floor of the city hall, lower level, uh, uh, and pretty much everything you see here is is occupied space. I will point out in this corner is a kind of the utility area, mechanical area where the boilers and, and uh, electrical systems and whatnot are over in this corner. The rest of it is space that has been occupied. The large white space in the middle is the public, sir, uh, the public corridor area. Um, so what we refer to as alternate 1A um, proposed um, a concept for, uh, dry flood proofing the building at this level, uh, the, the city hall basement, uh, in addition to the repairs and kinds that, that Corey referred to. Um, and, and in this instance, in this 1A, we were proposing to let the existing utilities, again, that's the area over here, uh, remain in place. So um, again, the, the basement is the most vulnerable part of city hall and uh, due to the flooding uh, and, and uh, the design flood elevation, if you will, and that is the level of flooding 
uh, that is likely to happen again, plus two vertical feet additional is the design standard that we're working towards to flood proof. So that uh, for that information, that's about five foot off of the floor of the building. So this is a cross section of the building. And this lower line here with my cursor is where the basement is. This red line, dotted line going here, this is the design flood elevation. Uh, and that's about five feet off the floor, a little bit less than five feet. So just you know that the basement is underwater with regard to floods, uh, the flood line. Okay, so this is a good information. These beige area, this beige area is, is the first and second floor. So jumping ahead, um, Dry flood proofing is a, uh, dry flood proofing essentially entails providing substantially impervious exterior wall conditions to the basement area of the building, and this uh, includes uh, protections to doors and windows um, by use of uh, some kind of floodgates or whatnot uh, to prevent water from coming in in the event of a flood. Now, just for what it is, uh, the windows are not shown here, but this, again, this line of flood is about the middle of the upper part of the windows in the basement. So just to give you some context. Um, uh, at this time, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, there are also many, in addition to the windows and doors, there are many holes in the wall of the basement. There are mechanical penetrations, uh, there are holes, there are cracks, there are all kinds of places where water can enter the building during a flood. Uh, as practically as possible, these openings must be uh, must be found and sealed uh, for the success of this approach, and, and there are many of them. And, and in the future, penetrations that might be made into the basement for utility work, for, you know, pounding something into the wall, for another, you know, cable or something to go through, those all have to be backfilled in the event you do this work. Anytime you open up another opening, you got to close it up. Otherwise, this, this system's really not going to work. Um, uh, and uh, the other thing we're going to do, this uh, may sound dramatic, but um, the design of this sort calls for allowing water to enter the basement through the slab in the event of a flood. There will be many holes drilled into the floor of the basement to allow water to come in in the event of a flood, and that water will um, um, be, uh, first of all, the lighting the water will reduce the hydrostatic pressure on the perimeter of the building in a flood event, but that water will come in at a slower pace and be pumped out at a faster pace than any water uh, coming in. So the idea is where there would be pumps that would, the holes would let the water in and the pumps would pump the water out faster than it's coming in. That's part of the design. It sounds crazy, but it's really part of an effective solution. Um, and although uh, the dry waterproofing system will protect the architectural components of the building, in this particular alternative, 1A, there are no provisions proposed to protect the mechanical systems. And, and we'll talk about that a little more. This means in the event of a future flood, the mechanical systems would go offline, not unlike what they did, and they would, it would be until you could resurface them and dry out the basement that you could reoccupy the space functionally. So that's alternative 1A, and that's part of what we were asked to look at, and, and, and so we wanted to point that out to you. Alternative 1B is actually essentially the same as 1A. However, in this alternative 1B, we're proposing that the utilities get moved to a higher location in the building. Um, if we go look at this cross-section again, and I'll have my cursor here, here's here's the basement. The utilities are basically all, oh, see this little dash line? This or this little base area. This is the sunken area where utilities are beyond the wall of the corridor, and all the utilities are in this back part of the building. Um, this cross section is intended to show that in the upper volumes of the building, there are places where the utilities might be relocated. Um, and, and I'll just say it for what it is. It could possibly be on the, on the second floor where the theater is or where the balconies are, or really more likely maybe in the attic space, which is a tremendous value of vo volume of space that could be a place where they could be uh, located. Um, uh, so we can, uh, let's see. And then, um, there are a couple of things that might not go there. Perhaps the uh, uh, elevator machine room, it wants to be on the lowest level of ele elevator service, ideally. And then also uh, there's a generator in the basement that might be proposed to be off the location of the, of the maybe off site here or further up the hill here on a place that is out of the floodplain. And maybe a generator could be provided that, that services all buildings and have, instead of having three separate generators. Um, so that's alternative 1B. Alternate 2 is uh, gets a little more dramatic, and uh, I'll go back to the basement plan for a moment. Um, alter, uh, th this idea suggests abandoning the basement and relocating the utilities. 
this is an option where basically because there's such high risk in this place that the basement might not be used anymore for administrative purposes or for any functional purposes. It would be filled in with concrete. Uh, largely, uh, the windows could be uh, historically represented on the outside by the opening, but there could be some blocking in there. And then a crawl space would be going in this place, about three to four foot high crawl space. The slab of that crawl space would be treated like it was in 1B, where there would be holes, water could come in and be pumped out. And in, in that instance, um, in alternate alternate two, uh, we, um, excuse me, uh, obviously spaces that are currently used by the city hall would have to be reprogrammed and relocated to another place. Okay, so um, we've looked into this a little bit. Um, uh, it's not fully fleshed out, but there are, there are several alternatives that will follow in this as well. Now, this I mean, it's important to say that per our conversations with the committee we've been working with, it's been suggested that the DPW offices that were one time in this space are currently uh, temporarily so-called working in the DPW garage, that the, there would be a move to really move them permanently there. So that would be part of the deprogramming of the basement, and then other spaces have to be relocated appropriately. Um, so that's alternate um, two, we say. There are some subalternates. So there's alternate 2A, um, which is uh, where additional city hall functions might be relocated uh, to other places, again, yet, undec yet undecided uh, once we figure out the programmatic uh, needs that could be finalized. In that instance, in 2A, we would also uh, uh, relocate the utilities, such as in alternate 1B. Now, alternate uh, 2B is also pretty dramatic, and I, I don't know if I have a slide of this in here. Uh, no, we don't have, oh, we don't have the, okay, the other site plan I was talking about. Okay, so um, alternate 2B is a little more dramatic because it refers to, uh, I don't have a diagram to show this, it refers to the, uh, re, uh, the, recon or the construction of a new fire station, abandonment of the existing fire station. Oh, I beg your pardon. I, excuse me. I, I'm, reading, I'm reading my notes quickly. Alternate 2B, I'm sorry. I, I, <laughs> hold that note. Uh, alternate 2B would be providing additional space for the city hall by creating an addition at the rear of the city hall, wh where you see my cursor is. So it's about the 30 feet that's behind the city hall. We would, and it's this is in the diagram booklet of the design. I'm, again, I'm sorry, I don't have that, but here. Uh, but there would be a two-story addition that would provide additional office space for the programmatic needs of the relocated spaces. It would have, um, it would tie into the existing elevator shaft, so that would be renovated and upgraded. Uh, and there would provide a new entrance from grade, um, accessible entrance from grade by virtue of a of a, a lift or a, another smaller elevator from grade up to the first floor. Uh, so the building would be accessible there. It would also provide uh, a, an alternate exiting plan from the second and third floors because there'd be a new stair in that addition, and and the uh, both of the theater and the first floor would uh, exit through that. And that is in the diagram package that you have uh, available to you. Um, and uh, with regard to the elevator, I just want to say this. It's important to note that your existing elevator could be or resurfaced, uh, put back in service at any time according to your, your, your wish. So uh, the only uh, caveat we'd like to say is that you might consider when you do that relative to the sequencing of any work going forward. Uh, we think that that elevator is past its serviceable age, and you might want to replace it at some point sooner rather than later. So... Um, now I'm going to jump to uh, what we call alternate F FS1, which is the fire station one. In this instance, we're talking about water, uh, I'm sorry, um, dry flood proofing the basement of the uh, fire station. This building is also below uh, the flood level. I think there's a section of the fire station, Corey, you can show. Yeah, okay, this is the section of the fire station, existing fire station. You can see the, the base area down below. This is all the lower level. This red line represents what the, the flood design plus two is. This is about four feet off the floor. Okay, so really your functional fire station for all intents and purposes is under the flood line. Uh, this diagram suggests uh, we might install a new elevator that services all level and, and abandon the uh, the ramps and service plaza on the outside because that is really where most of the water came in. Uh, we think that with some provisions, the basement could be fireproofed. I'm sorry, waterproofed, uh, damp-proofed. I'm thinking more than I'm saying. Um, and, and the building could be serviceable in some way. However, um, Really, the next option is something that uh, ought to be uh, considered. The, 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 the challenge with this uh, scheme is that the building will flood. 
uh, to some degree and will not be entirely serviceable in the event of an emergency. So something to consider, which leads us to to the this big idea of uh, alternate what we call FS2, where we might pr we propose that the fire station be considered to be a new building, a new construction building here on the southeast side of your property. That's a uh, on the hill going on this parking area uh, where it would be completely out of the floodplain. It could provide a new state of the art uh, facility. Um, and it, again, it's on a higher elevation. Uh, we did a study uh, to uh, see that the an adequately sized building can fit there, including some maneuverability and regrading uh, for uh, equipments and vehicles and whatnot. Uh, this approach would require uh, reconsideration of really the parking and the traffic lines through that part of the site and around the public buildings here. So it's a bigger bigger idea, but uh, could get you out of trouble with the fire station. And, and this approach also provides an opportunity to repurpose the existing fire station then uh, by, uh, again, floodproofing it, maybe raising the first, first floor to a higher level, and it could be used either for public, uh, for uh, a city hall programmatic purposes, maybe maybe the council chamber or something goes in here, there's the upper floor, uh, or it could possibly be turned into a commercial redevelopment opportunity, you know, that the city would would uh, manage. So thank you. So we need to get Bob online. I don't know, can Bob unmute himself? And he's going to speak to costs um, and risk. risk and some funding options. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Can you be a little louder, Bob? Um, sure. Let me see if I can turn my volume up. Huh. Uh, I don't know how to get to that setting. I'll, if I speak louder, can you hear me now? Oh, wait a minute. Here it is. Audio settings. I'm afraid I'm maximum on my speaker, so I'll try to speak loudly. Well, um, better now. Yep. Better? Okay. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but um, trying to boil this down to um, sort of a simple kind of explanation for a complex project. Um, the table you see before you shows those alternatives that Mark just walked through. I'll briefly kind of walk through each of those discuss what we have for the alternative cost and talk a little bit about the, the big difference here is the, um, the risk between the different choices that are available. So we consider all of these to be viable alternatives, but they have different costs and they have different risk profiles. Um, so to start with the upper block, which is the city hall alternatives, the first one we mentioned was restore the city hall to a pre-flood condition our cost estimator has it at about a little over $2 million to put that back together. And if we spent that money, there would be no investment in making that space more resilient. So that is a new building. And with the frequency and intensity of storms you have, we seem to be on a frequency of flooding out once every 10 years, probably not a great investment. And, um, and there are resources that we'll talk about later that might help us take that further but $2 million just as a base to sort of bring you back to where you were pre-flood. The second alternative, uh, City Hall Alternative 1A, which is that dry flood proofing where we get those walls substantially impervious and we have a little bit of water leaking in on the floor, um, that's 2.9 million. So now we've spent some resources to try to close all the openings of the wall and add some resiliency. And we are protecting the infrastructure by having a substantially impervious wall, we're also trying to recognize that uh, that's a tall order. You know, there's something in the order of 40 different windows, there's dozens of penetrations, and over time, people can put new penetrations in. So if you have a breach in the perimeter of the wall, our strategy of pumping clean water at a rate that, that exceeds the water coming in is lost, and you will be back to all of that's for naught. Um, so we looked at, as we've said, as Mark said earlier, at an alternative to move all of the infrastructure out of that basement. So alternative city hall CH1B, dry flood proof, elevate utilities within the building, that jumps the cost up a couple million dollars. Um, we're confident that there's room up in the attic and other places for the electrical and switch gear. There's room on the site to get the generator out of there. You also have in the basement boilers 
that are used for supplemental heat for the district heating system. And so this cost includes replacing those up into the upper elements of City Hall building, but probably going to a propane system. That's partly why it's as expensive as it is. But that's a jump from you know, 2.9 to $5 million to sort of bring the risk from, you still have some risk. You know, If we have a breach now for that basement space, it means you have some finished spaces that get wiped out, but at least the building's up and running the next day and, and this infrastructure also supports the fire station. So you have you know, your critical facilities available to continue you know, the important work you need to do, particularly in an emergency. So those are the dry flood proofing alternatives. Alternative two is to now abandon the basement and fill the basement. Um, this uh, includes the cost to do fit up for DPW and to do some office fit up within the city hall. It's actually less expensive than 1B. Um, at this point, we've elevated utilities, we've moved all functions, essentially all functions. There's a little bit of mechanical down there that can be easily put back online um, for $4 million. Um, but we identified that um, we haven't, we, we, we're not clear that we have enough space to accommodate all of the office spaces, you know, in, in the upper floors of City Hall without displacing other things. You know, we have all, you have other uses there now. You have the theater up on the upper floor, and there's work to be done to be sure that we can fit all the remaining offices other than DPW into that space. But if we cannot do that, and that's where you get to 2B, which is we fill the basement, we put a, an addition off the back of the building, we move those, you know, an equal amount of space that's displaced into an addition off the back, and we're back up to $5.3 million. Um, but on this one, your risk in a flood event in City Hall is approaching zero. At this point, you don't have functions in the basement. You don't have utilities in the basement. Um, you should be able to, you don't have active measures. You don't have to run around and put floodgates in. Um, the building will be resilient in the sense that we filled behind those windows up to flood height. And there might be a little bit of leakage in there, but in general, you're gonna be able to come through that and be fully functional um, very, very quickly. Uh, any questions on, on City Hall? Is that clear in terms of cost and alternatives? Okay. Going for right now. Okay, well, let's talk about the fire station a little bit then. So, so restoring the fire station, the fire station uh, doesn't need as much work to put it back online. It's mostly basement and apparatus space that got flooded. So our estimates at $430,000 for restoring the current damage. We also looked at a strategy to drive flood proof the fire station. So roughly four or five feet above the apparatus floor, we've got floodgates on those apparatus doors. That's a tall order, but one that has been done. You know, you've got to build some kind of a hydraulic gate that closes. Um, so for a million and a half, we can restore, we can put floodgates and we can have the fire station um, more resilient than it is currently. The the risk at that point to recognize is that, you know, in the event of a flood, you lose the fire station. Um, and, um, you know, they've got a stage offsite somewhere. They've got to get their apparatus out of there. If they need to go back to the fire station to get equipment, it's difficult to do that. The doors are blocked up with gates. Um, if you need to go, you know, get directly in, if there's a breach, you may be down for a while before they can go get their equipment cleaned out and ready to go again. So, we really wanted to look and identify for you the cost of um, really moving the fire station as a critical facility out of the floodplain entirely. Um, if I had the right to share a screen, we do have a site plan that shows where a new footprint for a two-story fire station could go on the um, rear portion of the parking lot next to City Hall. So on land you own, we believe we can fit a fire station you would lose most of the parking though that's south of City Hall in order to move in and out of the fire station um, and, and access that. Um, so that $8.7 million, which is not, you know, which is, a, which is a big number, but it's a number that we've proofed against similar fire stations around New England. That does not include the cost to put the current fire station back online. So you could, do the dry flood proofing and you could, you know, then relocate displaced office spaces from the basement of City Hall into the fire station, but you'd actually have more space 
if you chose to repurpose the fire station for your own use than you did when you started before the flood. Um, and obviously you could you know, put it on the market and see if someone else wants to take on repurposing the fire station. It's a great building and a robust building, but um, a difficult place to be for a critical facility during a flood. Uh, and then uh, finally, to close this section out, the police station is, um, is out of the floodplain. It is fairly resilient now. It is under hydrostatic pressure. It acted as we would expect the building for dry flood proof. It had water coming in. The water was not dirty, muddy water. It was clean and it was coming in at a rate that could have been pumped out, but it needed to have um, battery or generated uh, uh, some pumps adequate to evacuate the water and a couple of check valves to prevent backflow. So that cost is estimated at around $100,000 to tune that up, but um, that building is in much better shape. Uh, if I could add a few comments about risk, um, you know, the in, in the in the world of uh, floodproofing design, uh, FEMA has some standards that talk about benefits and costs. And whenever they look at a, um, you know, they, they look at, is it worth making an investment based on floods? They look at the frequency of flooding and they look at the life of the building. And um, typically, you know, municipal facilities like these are uh, much longer than your typical commercial building in terms of life. You know, these buildings um, properly built and maintained will see another hundred years where mostly we assume buildings useful lives in the order commercially of, of 39 or, or 40 years. And then the frequency in this case for Montpelier, you know, we've identified at least four different events from the, since the 1920s, you know, and the last two within 10 years. So it's fairly frequent that we're seeing this and as a municipal facility, you're gonna have a long time to, um, to amortize an investment to reduce your risk. And this really now comes down to a question about, you know, um, as I say, all of these are viable alternatives, but it's a question about cost and it's a question about risk. You know, how much, how much effort or how, how far do we go to move to a risk that approaches zero? And in the case of filling the basement or moving the fire station, we've moved probably fully to those two critical facilities having little, uh, little remaining risk due to a flood. Um, I do have some uh, comments. I want to I want to share some feedback, some work we've done, and some conversations about additional funding for City Hall. But I'd like to stop and see if there's any questions about these costs um, or alternatives at this point. Well, well, sure, I, I, can I can start. start. I, I, other, other people, people may have some uh, questions also, but uh, <clears throat> in terms of the- I've lost uh, audio. Can you guys hear this? Is part of your uh, uh -oh. expertise working with FEMA to have a sense from of what FEMA is, uh, is going me? to be uh, able and willing to fund of these costs of, of various uh, various uh, stage, various alter alternatives of the project. Ooh. And that's a question for Bob. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, but, uh, well, the whole meeting is <laughs> is offline, so we need to wait. Oh. Okay. Anybody hear me? Because you no, guys are off too, right? Just happens with the laptop sometimes. Bob, I can hear you. I'm oh, not great. sure why others aren't Kinda answering, but I can hear you. Yeah, I think somebody had questions, and I lost all audio. Oh, no. I'll oh, stick on. It's a Wi-Fi problem. Yeah, it looks strong. I don't have any internet. Sure, maximum the uh, it almost looks like we lost all the council chamber. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. yeah, it looks like City Hall's out. Yeah. yeah. Right. Maybe they're rebooting the system. Could be. Yeah, because it looks like we dropped quite a few people that were on that. So. But we can, we can still, still hear you, so you're, you're not. Home. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'll i stay on. I was about to reboot myself. <laughs> nope, nope, you're good. Hey, we just lost the, the council, that's all. Yeah. Well, hopefully have a good discussion. <laughs> I think. So the question was, was that the only location looked at for the fire station? And obviously, I defer to the folks, but it's 
it's city owned. So in terms of uh, you know looking at places for a fire station that are non city owned, you know that's a much that's a much you know wider search and um, one that was actually attempted before I came here. Kim, you might have been part of that. And, you know, many years were spent trying to find a good place. Um, so I think you know, in terms of again I'd like to answer that in terms of expeditiousness. It's, t it's here in the city complex. It's owned by the city. The back part of it's out of the flood plain. Um, so that's why we get to choose. And it, it may or may not be the optimal place. But well, you know, yeah, that's we'll start. Go ahead, Colin. Thank you. Will you just text Bob? Well, it looks like we've lost the entire internet internet connection here. Yeah. Yeah, that's what's going on. But maybe it's starting to work now because I just Googled something and. <laughs> yeah. We don't know. Uh, it's just encouraging. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can. You're back. You're back. We can, we can hear you. Hmm. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay, okay, don't, don't, don't start, start yet. yet. We're okay. And I think, I think you might, might need, need to reshare the. the if it, if, it if it helps, we could probably, probably not share, share if, uh, to, have to have the conversation. I don't know if that over, overwhelmed it. Um, I don't think it overwhelmed that that happens sometimes. Uh -huh. It's, it's just, just like the Wi-Fi goes, goes out sometimes in the building. Well, I'm not, my computer isn't connected to the internet, to the, to the network yet. yet. It hasn't connected yet. Right. That one literally just hit. Ah, uh, here we are. Everybody connected as far as you can tell? Bob, I know you mentioned sharing a, a plan of what the that firehouse was look like. Is that something we can see? Yeah, uh, let's see if I can share my screen. Sure. Let me see if I can get it up here. Uh, is everybody seeing this plan? Yes. Yes. Okay, so you see the fire station, city hall, police. And this is the rear portion of the parking lot. And it, this is above the base flood elevation. And the, this is showing some fire truck turning radiuses. And of course the truck can go along the back of the parking lot and might get its tires wet, but it's mostly out of the floodplain to get over to the side street to the right here of the page. That's the concept to put a new fire station back here. That, that's if I could say that's based upon the lot that the city owns and um, you know taking on this kind of thing the city might consider a bigger picture look at the whole block but this is based upon the information we have access to right now thank you all right well <clears throat> I was starting with some questions and my first question had to do with your knowledge and expertise of working with FEMA and what fraction of, of all these costs we can expect yeah. from FEMA considering different alternatives. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we started really, you know, to find the problem, we wanted to identify viable alternatives and all of these alternatives um, follow the guidelines 
that FEMA puts out for flood mitigation. So we're using standards of care for how do you manage a flood? And we've done this, we've, we have a lot of experience with flood proofing designs. Uh, and as we say, they have a different risk, risk profile. The thing that is different with municipalities is that FEMA has a different program for grant funding. And I'm not an expert necessarily on the grant funding, but we've met twice with them. We've discussed these alternatives tr to try to understand to what degree would the, any of these alternatives be eligible for FEMA grant funding to pay for. Um, so the first thing to note is that you have some insurance from the impact from the flood, and that will tap out at a certain dollar amount. Um, and it will cover both your premium amount and it'll cover what we call codes and standards. Because whenever you rebuild a building after a, uh, an, emer uh, an insurance event, you have to build it back to today's building codes. And part of those codes include the flood codes. So all of the things that we've identified are in, in the purpose of meeting the flood codes. In addition to your insurance, FEMA, the representatives uh, who support the state right now do the emergencies and represent FEMA have told us that these projects, including the new fire station are potentially eligible for grant funds to cover the difference between what your insurance pays for and the full cost of the project. Um, even clarified to the point, these are preliminary numbers, good numbers to compare alternatives to, but they're not the final numbers. There's work that needs to be done to get really firm numbers on this. And they were clear that if we go through the process and we're eligible, that they would actually pay for the actual cost, not, not these, uh, necessarily the initial costs that have been come up with. So I think where we sit now is wanting to share this you know, get feedback from the council and the staff. And then based on those conversations with the representatives from FEMA is we would identify what the preferred alternative is. And then we'd articulate that more clearly, whatever that is. And it may be a combination of the ones we've identified. It doesn't have to be the specific ones here. It could be, you know, it could be pieces of all of these. Um, we'd wrap that into a final report and then begin discussions with FEMA to firm up Will they in fact pay for, if you choose to put a new fire station, will they pay for that? And if we build a new fire station, will they pay to flood proof the old fire station to put it back in use? Or is that off the table? So there's work to be done, um, but the initial conversations are encouraging that um, you know, FEMA really wants to see municipalities not have to go back. Uh, you know, they, they underwrite your insurance premiums for the flood damage as well. So it's really all coming out of the same pocket they don't really want to see you back in another 10 years with another claim of $2 million to restore the basement. They'd like to get this done with. And um, it was pointed out to us that, um, you know, they're familiar with Vermont. This is in fact, this kind of coordinated building project is something that was done in Waterbury after Irene, where, you know, the, the city offices were, uh, sorry, state offices were rebuilt in a way. Some of those basements were filled, some were abandoned and they built some new buildings and uh, FEMA actually developed a new program that they said was probably applicable here to cover this cost as well. So I, I think, you know, we can't say uh, with 100% confidence that this is gonna get paid for by FEMA and there may be some elements <clears throat> that they don't fully cover, um, but we've been encouraged that in fact, that funding would be available and it's sort of a, it's a journey to work our way through that. And, and we would really recommend, you know, identifying what you think is in your best interest, working on firming up the funding before investing in a lot, a lot more design and cost estimates and other things. And once the funding is firmed up, then start to invest in the additional uh, work needed to firm up the cost and advance your project in those steps. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, something jumped out at me as I was reading your report at the bottom of page nine of 13, where you say, all the alternatives discussed are in the pursuit of meeting flood code requirements. Therefore, they, there may be little cost difference to Montpelier residents between the alternatives. And it sounds like you're telling us that as we're considering these alternatives, costs shouldn't be yeah. really what we're looking at. Yeah, our understanding is that there may be no difference in cost to the residents of Montpelier. Uh, it seems, uh, you know, highly unlikely to say that, but that's what we believe right now. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 
<laughs> <laughs> so are we dealing with this with a legitimate OPM situation? Yeah. Other people's money. Right. Uh a great deal of other people's money. Yes. <laughs> yeah. To be firmed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other members of the council have it? There's this is a lot to take in. Yeah. Obviously. Understood. Um go ahead, Sal. Bob, if you could just clarify, um, you were talking about next steps. Uh, how far down do we have to go? How far down the road do we have to go with, you know, design and elements before FEMA gets involved, a, a proposal, a firm application to, to FEMA can be made? Right. I, I think we've done enough design work. So hmm. the work that we've done um, is sufficient to communicate the flood proofing strategy and, and how that's consistent with the regulations and and I should have mentioned you know you're entitled to an exemption under FEMA rules because these are historic buildings so we actually have a we have some flexibility in being fully compliant um, nonetheless we're proposing to be consistent with the standards of care for flood proofing according to FEMA guidelines so really all we need to do is to choose the, the best alternative um, package that up fully and then describe those, you know, with this report, I think update this report to just show what the preferred alternative is and then forward that to FEMA and say, we'd like to verify that this is eligible. What do you see problems with this? Are there, you know, for instance, you know, if we were choose, if we chose say city hall alternative one A or B, where we're dry flood proofing the basement, um, they might not, they might say that paying to do fit up work and DPW garage for DPW staff is additional cost that we don't need to get you back whole because we've got, you know, a basement now available for where they were before. If we fill the basement and then we've displaced those and they, and that would be included. So those are the kinds of nuances um, that might come up, but um, yeah. Yeah. But I don't think we need to invest a lot more in design. We really just need to finish this stuff. Bob, I wasn't on the meeting Monday. This is Corey. Um, they've seen our work, or at least yeah. progress of it, right? So the FEMA yeah. representatives have seen some of the work that we've done as far as design. Yeah, although it's going to need to go up the, these are the, the FEMA advisors and consultants. It's going to have to go up the line for approval. Yeah. And they would work with these estimated costs or with, with your final estimated costs, even though they, they would yeah. ultimately pay actual costs. Yeah. Yeah, okay. we'd have to we'd improve them, or I should say, up to update them as the project progresses. Yeah, Adrian. So on, um, I'm just trying to pull the slide up. Uh, slide 23 for the proposed movement of the fire station to the lot back there. Mm. It, it's it's has, it looks like the gray area is the edge of the hundred year flood planning. Right. Um, but my memory, and I don't know where that data came from, but my memory is that that whole parking lot back there was completely underwater. And so you said it would be wet tires leaving that new fire station out to the street, but I think it was like a leak. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, I mean, by our understanding uh, where the high flood water was during the most recent event and by the data that we collected from available sources about the, the, the floodplains, um, that this solution is 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 viable we are out of the 500 year line we're pretty much at the 500 year line uh i think is where the floor of the proposed the roughly the finished floor of the uh, proposed apparatus room is so we're we're uh we are above the current design requirements but i think the adrian's point it's roughly the same look location flood wise as the police station but if you drive out of there, you're driving through water to get well, to the street. Right. Yeah. And 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 all due respect, at this point in time, diagrammatically, you know, uh, in my professional opinion, as you know, working on all kinds of projects, is that that whole back area needs to be reconsidered in terms of you know grading and whatnot. We did a a fairly uh, you know very conceptual diagram based upon what's what there without looking beyond. I think ultimately this has to be looked beyond that footprint on the site. Yeah, I would say we would definitely look comprehensively at this whole area because mm. from my recollection right. of the July flood, it was yeah. like, I mean, this whole area was very much underwater. I can't imagine a fire truck going through there, even in that new location. 
mm. would be driving through a lake. Do you don't remember? Was that like up to your? Yeah, I got photos. Oh, really? Okay. Okay. That's how I get back through town. It was what they're describing is correct. It was dry back through. Yeah. So but it was certainly before that was the lake. I, I noticed on the plan that includes an addition to be, I guess. Yeah. There are public restrooms. Well, that's the, the proposed back. idea. We were asked to consider. Oh, I don't think yes. you mentioned. Oh, I, 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 I thought I mentioned me. I was supposed to have mentioned. It was in my writing. I may have skipped that line. Um, the, the, the staff asked us in that sure. diagram to consider putting public restrooms on grade, accessible from the outside. Yes, and I'm glad they did. And right? so, uh, that's, so the that's building real positive. Really, there's no finished floor except for those restrooms <laughs> below the flood line. Everything else is up above. You notice that diagram says there's an unexcavated area that would just be backfilled, and but the restrooms would be they'd be in the floodway, but they would, you know, they would be available while they're working. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Lauren. Thanks. Um, I am really interested in hearing what city staff, I know there's pros and cons to like moving more people to different locations around the community in terms of like staff cohesion and easiness of doing your work and just maybe just speaking a little bit more about how many office spaces we lose if we go for the, um, you know, filling in the basement option, which seems from a flood proofing, like a great idea, but then, you know, how are you thinking about what is best for the staff and, you know, which of these alternatives are looking most appealing from that perspective? So I, I would say where, where, you, know, you are, we, we're evaluating all the options. There's pros and cons to all of it. And I think the goal tonight was to, see if there was anything that you said absolutely we wouldn't consider or, you know, we like this or just what kind of questions you had that we can then get information to make sure when we come back. Our plan as a team, including with Stevens, is to come back at a future meeting with our recommendation from our team to you, but we want to make sure you had your chance to weigh in and even as you think about it to let us know what, what you're thinking so that, um, so yes, there are advantages and disadvantages. You know, we've had people working in basements and we probably shouldn't put them back in again. On the other hand, uh, we're all here, but if they were just next door or right behind here, maybe it's not, you know, so we've got to, there's pros and cons to all of it. And uh, don't, I, I don't think we're ready to give you a recommendation yet. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yeah. I mean, I guess just my general feeling is I think storms are going to get more severe, more frequent. And so going for the lower risk options while we have this opportunity where the cost could be covered seems like the prudent thing to do. Um, so I'm interested in looking at moving the fire station and making sure that utilities are moved up and doing the things that are resilient to the 500 year flood that could come any day now. Yeah, um, I just agree with that. And I just want to thank you for all this work. This is incredibly comprehensive and really the way you laid it out and presented it, it's very easy to understand. Okay. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like if we're going to do this, we should be thinking in terms of something that we're not going to have to, we're not going to be regretting um, the next time a flood comes along because it's going to be happening again. Uh, I have one question about the this diagram with the the uh, police, uh, the fire station being moved over here. If we if we did that and we added on to the back of City Hall, would there then still be enough room for the fire trucks to move in? And That's out? a great question. We haven't looked at it that level of detail. And like I said, mm -hmm. uh, these are kind of isolated diagrams at this point in time. That's why I, I do think going forward with a bigger picture, really the whole area needs to be looked at yeah, okay. uh, to see what the different implications are, to see what the net result and parking opportunities are. I mean, I don't want to say this out loud, but I've spent some something that, you know, might drive you crazy, but it be, could be a lot of solutions there. But you have to look at it at that increment when you're ready. Yeah. All right. And there's also Thank the you. issue that if we were to do that, uh, again, depending on what's fundable, that the fire station, we wouldn't need the addition to the back of City Hall because the fire station could be converted like that's what I was to be saying. Yeah, that's, that's an option. spaces, yeah. um, you know, the, the yeah. office spaces and maybe the apparatus floor raised and becomes the big right. meeting spaces. Yeah. And kind of that's right. I would say it's unlikely that we'd need to do both. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Overall, as I, as I look at this, you know, in just in Bill's question of, well, 
what are the things we would we would say no to at this point? I would say that the the option one in uh, choices in City Hall, it just seemed like it's not really buying us what we need for security, and I don't I don't think that's a prudent thing to do. You know, and I could get into little tiny details, but just overall, yeah. the way you've written it, it sounds like you're saying you can't really count it assumes an extended long-term active participation and employee of employees who are in those office spaces you know you need to check to make sure your windows are closed all you know you need to do all this stuff that realistically is hard to count yeah. on so i i would be inclined to just rule out uh, the options that that involve restoring and keeping open the basement of this building yeah it's well put tim yeah, I agree with you. Um, and it's by, so I think basically for me, it would be probably um, 2A for City Hall uh, and try to avoid putting an addition on it. I think we've got a lot of space in this building and I'm not sure you had a lot of time to study potential yeah. uses. And we may have a few sacred cows we have to talk about in terms of people and spaces that we need to free up for city operations. Um, but I, I think that's, we need to consider that. Um, fire station it just even before the flood looking at it it's an old old building and the equipment keeps getting bigger and bigger and um, I think it's it's served us well for many years but it's done its job so I think we do need to look at a new one I'm not sure the, the location you proposed is where I would go but I think we can dust off a study and look at some options and um, see what's yeah. out there and, and the police station is pretty obvious so uh, yeah the other thing is district heat. Do we really need to have boilers for district heat? Is, that's we, kind of... we can speak to that for a moment. What we understand is is what is in the city hall is supplemental part of that system. So it's a backup system. If the district heat goes down, the boilers and the pumps in the city hall location are are supporting that. So uh, we also understand that the the uh, it, and, and maybe uh, the staff could speak to it better than me or. or... I think Kurt is the one that's spoke to it in the yeah. past, but we understand it's pretty essential to the current system yeah. and, and the relationships and, and the agreements that there are right. with other parties. But in, in generic, we also understand that it could, that what is in city hall could go somewhere else. So that's the important mm -hmm. thing I wanted to say. While the system's important, the relationships, the dynamics are important. The physical location of what is city hall in city hall on behalf of the district, he could physically go somewhere else. Well, most of the buildings in the fairly new system still have heating systems. Right. No, we may not. It just may not be a piece we have to provide. Something, something to talk about. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. We don't need to go over every square inch of the plans at this point, but I want to. Okay. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> I want it gone, Bill. <laughs> Mayor, if I if I could just interject for a second as well, um, for what it's worth, I, I kind of agree with the councils Heaney and Gill. If we've got photos of what it looked like behind the firehouse when it flooded, and if the water doesn't go any higher, we'd be skirting as close as possibly could be with a fire truck across the front of the PD while probably still having water up to the bottom of the doors on a fire truck. That's not even trying to get out of the station and immediately trying to hook a right hand turn without going deep into water. So I, I guess it's just something we'd have to consider. You identify yourself for the record. I know who you are. Oh, sorry about that. Ken Christman, I, I work at the fire department. I, I was there in the floods and stuff. I'm the union president and stuff. So thanks, Ken. Thank you. Um, yeah, the only other, the, the little petty thing that I was going to raise was if we're talking about reoccupying the uh, the basement level and everything going above five feet that prop may lead to some ada issues with regard to switches and stuff right i mean those are details that are yeah that that has to be considered as part of a bigger picture again mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons that um, you know there's a lot to trying to preserve the basement and not saying you don't want to do it. Yeah. You're, 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 you're making good points. Yeah. I'm saying, I don't, I, th I don't think that's a, a good alternative. 
No. I just wanted to um, to add to what what's been said about um, the options. I mean, I think we ought to go for broke on the on the fireproof on the flood proofing, getting everything up out of the water filling in the basement. But I think that I think the fire station. I think we really need to move it um, because no matter what we do to proof it in place, uh, it'll be out of commission pretty much in a flood. Yeah. And the yeah. equipment will have to be staged elsewhere, and it, it's kind of a mess, really. Um, so I would, I would endorse that as well. I mean, maybe that the spot that's been chosen is not right. the spot, but we ought to think seriously about about that. And it also affects whether we put an addition on this building or not. So the fire station really kind of dictates a lot of what I think will eventually happen. Mm -hmm. Lauren, um, and just back to the what. FEMA might cover question. So if we were moving in a direction of filling the basement in City Hall, so going with one of the option two um, for City Hall, moving the fire station, would we then be able to, because we're losing office space, make the case for renovations of the old fire station for new office space? So could we get a threefer or is that? Uh, no, I think so. That's yeah. Great. Yeah. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 In the interest of the rest of the meeting, Mm -hmm. <laughs> and how long we're going to be here. I, I think we have enough information. Obviously, if you have more questions or comments you want to make, I don't want to cut you off, but I think we've got the general feedback that we needed to go back and, and work with our team and then come back to you with plans and run stuff unless the Stevens folks need more. But No, we're good. We're very good. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we'll provide information through your team as necessary. So. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Good night, everyone. All right. Next, we have Regional Planning Commission River uh, River Program. While they're coming up, I'll just note that uh, I meant to say this at the beginning of the meeting, but for those tuning in, uh, we've been organizing our council meetings sort of around our goals and tonight's theme is about resiliency and recovery and um, you know environmental sustainability. So pretty much everything we'll be talking about tonight is somehow uh, related to that. In case, in case you're wondering why why they're all about this topic, it was intentional. That's So we're focused on that issue tonight. And with that, I'll introduce you to Christian Meyer. Director of the Central Vermont Regional Planning Committee. Uh, Planning Commission. Mic up too, Christian. Yeah, sure. Is that? <laughs> All right. That should be a little better. Um, as a result of the summer flooding, FEMA made $90 million available to the state of Vermont uh, for hazard mitigation programs. Um, these funds, taxes, these funds, um, engineering work is needed to be done for a preliminary application. Uh, what I'm here to talk about is the program the state has set up to uh, support municipalities pull together that engineering work. I'll give you an overview and then pass it over to Keith Cubbin, my colleague. Um, we also have Will over here. Will Pitkin um, he won't be speaking tonight, but he's also working on this and may be a familiar face further down the road. Um, so uh, as I stated, engineering work will be necessary to have a competitive application for these $90 million. So the state has made... Uh, engineering services available for projects that are aimed at directly reducing floodwaters or mitigating flood impacts in the cities of Barrie and Montpelier. Um, our goal tonight is to reach out to uh, the city of Montpelier and try to track down all the ideas and projects that may be out there and try to get them all into the hopper at this early stage so that as uh, we work with the engineers, as the city uh, work has ongoing conversations similar to the one you just had, um, we refine that list until we really get down to a select few uh, that have community buy-in and municipal buy-in uh, for any potential uh, match that might come along with a, a large-scale uh, kind of marquee um, uh, hazard resilience pro uh, hazard resilience project. Uh, so with that thumbnail, I will pass it off to Keith for the details. Okay. Uh my name is Keith Kevin, Emergency Management Planner at CVRPC. Uh, the River Program, uh, got on Friday so we could all get the acronym right because, sorry, it's not an easy one to remember. Uh, Resilience Initiative for Vermont Empowerment and Recovery. 
So the goal was try to mitigate flooding uh, substantially in the most affected communities. Uh, we have two primary targets or project areas uh, in the Central Vermont region, uh, Montpelier and the Winooski River, and then Barry City and uh, the Stevens Branch. Uh, so yeah, our entire uh, uh, plan or strategy is to try to get any ideas that have come out of uh, the forums that have already been held or any ideas that are in the community for actually uh, mitigating flooding. We'll take that uh, to the engineers. Uh, SLR is who the uh, engineer is, the engineering form, that firm for our region. Uh, throughout the state, there's a couple other firms in some of the other parts, but that's who we get to work with. And that's obviously we consider that good news because uh, that team has worked extensively within our region and knows it already. Uh, so they'll parse those ideas for what's going to uh, basically be the trying to get the uh, largest return for the investment and also for trying to find the best projects that the communities will want to support. Uh, these projects actually break up into five different types uh, that basically that hazard mitigation grant program uh, is willing to fund. You know, one is the primary, the buyouts and removal of buildings, elevations, which we know you're already trying to work with, uh, relocation of buildings, flood proofing, as we already heard tonight, and uh, some that can be any non-residential building. So, I mean, that can be done to the commercial buildings in downtown and the historic as well, or at least, you know, obviously from what we already saw, you know, uh, it can be a longer process, but that can still be done. And then uh, number five, which is one we're hoping to be able to find very good projects to actually lower the base flood elevation, you know, uh, be that dam removal, uh, floodplain reconnection, berm removal. Uh, and of the total projects that we bring into this list, uh, at the end, we'll also part out or, you know, kind of try to break out the projects that we can find other funding sources. So even if it doesn't fit into a hazard mitigation grant program, if we're aware of uh, like clean water initiative uh, funding that could possibly still work for like berm removal, that sort of thing, we will then try to uh, push some of those projects off into uh, other streams that we could still get them implemented and try to mitigate flooding in our region. You know, I mean, this is, you know, a, uh, we're kind of at that inflection point with climate change, you know, so trying to get ahead as much as we can and use the the initiative as much as possible to, uh, you know, strengthen our future of being here. I gave a couple of quick examples in what I handed out just to uh, show you some stuff. Obviously, uh, didn't have to talk about dry flood proofing since we just had a <laughs> real long uh, discussion about it. Uh, but we definitely want to coordinate with any of the groups that are working in Montpelier. So uh, if there's any, you know, we already have met with the city staff and discussed this with them. Uh, met with uh, Josh Jerome as well and uh, making sure we're trying to coordinate together. Uh, but if there's anybody that has any ideas or any uh, uh, of the uh, private groups, I think. Uh, uh, I'm up next. Yeah, yeah, they're up next. Uh, we, we, yeah, it, we'll, we'll definitely want to uh, pick their brains and get their ideas. Uh, and this will, this will provide that advanced assistance with the engineering to actually uh, get projects to that HMGP uh, application. So usually in that process, you would have to go through a scoping study or something. This is basically kind of fast tracking that. It'll do the scoping piece of it so those projects can go directly into application and try to access that 90 million uh, that the state has already uh, been told that we will be able to uh, get for this mm -hmm. flood. And actually, that number is still being, it's not finalized. It could still move higher, you know, as we finish the uh, PA public assistance. What's the timeline? Yeah. Oh, uh, the current timeline is uh, for October of this year, but uh, we expect an extension on that. So it'll probably go into next year before uh, the project will have to be finished up. Uh, we will do also public outreach meetings uh, with this. So uh, once we kind of start to formalize the idea of a, a, a final list of projects. We'll do make sure we do a public engagement meeting and have the engineers there to discuss that with the public and try to uh, work through any ideas or any issues anybody may have. Oh, well, that actually gets to the question I was thinking, which is what's your process? Yeah, our 
so uh because of there being so many public means already we're not we don't uh, we're not expecting to have to do another public meeting just to collect the ideas but there will be uh there's a, two rivers is setting up a uh, web page currently and then there should be a online like just more like a google form that anybody would be able to log into and put in an idea if they have one uh, we also try to collect anything that came out of those previous meetings already and then once the engineering firm has a time you know and they're also going to look at the entire watershed so if there's uh projects that they can see that are in a uh, upstream community that might really benefit Montpelier we'll actually then approach them and try to target the best projects we can find for mm -hmm. you know getting a substantial reduction okay any questions or comments from members of the council I think we're set on that. We we weren't we weren't expecting you weren't expecting us to. Yeah. No, we I, give you. No, no, we're not expecting anything really out of you tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll just continue to uh, coordinate with Josh, uh, mm -hmm. as the point person for the city. Uh, as long as and, you're all fine with that. Folks that are yes. Next to the yes. And, yeah. Don't leave when they. No, no. Actually, okay. I want to hear what they have to say. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you bringing this to our attention. MCRR. Yes, absolutely. Well, it's nice to see uh, nice to see you again. Uh, my name's uh, Ben Doyle. I'm the chair of the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience, and this is uh, our newly hired executive director, John Copians. Yeah, it's a pleasure. welcome, it's a pleasure Kurt, and congratulations to both of you for making this next step. Yeah, it's uh, we're really excited. So I'm gonna just. Um, you know, I know I, I've spoken with you before a few, few months ago. Um, we did have a public forum where a number of you attended, but just as a kind of to level set in the room, just a reminder that the Montpelier Commission for Recovery and Resilience is a, an initiative that it was a partnership between the city of Montpelier, Montpelier Alive, and the Montpelier Foundation. And we were uh, really formed coming out of the large forums that were convened this summer after the flood with the idea that the kind of charge of the commission or the role of the commission is to provide leadership to coordinate recovery and resiliency strategies, advocate for the community, oversee future staff, and support the progress of initiatives throughout the community. I like to just think of it as, uh, just to put it real simply, uh, it's a group that just really looks for opportunities for good things to happen that need a little bit of leadership or frankly like relentlessly optimistic bird dogging to make stuff happen. And so that's really what we're trying to do. Um, and so, you know, what I'd like to do is really just update you since our last meeting, like what, what, what the heck have we been doing? And so, um, you know, basically we've been continuing to really organize the structure of like, who are we as a commission and how do we function and how are we interacting with the community? How are we soliciting ideas? How are we running them through an equity lens? You know, all of these kinds of considerations that are actually real important to get it right. You know, I like to think of it as if you, you know, if, if you want to go fast, like, um, you know, go alone. But if you want to go far, right, take your time and, and go with others. And that's really what we've been um, trying to do. And the other work that we've been doing is really like research. I mean, I think probably Bill knows this better than anybody that there's there's so many incredible plants that have come to the city of Montpelier over 30 years and lots of really great things have happened from those plans, but then there are other components that didn't move forward for whatever reason or research that's been done, like even just like something like the 1996 flood elevation studies for buildings around town, like there's a lot of great stuff. And so just making sure we understand the kind of context um, so that we're not like making recommendations or taking on things uh, in a vacuum. Uh, you know, obviously, too, hiring a director was a really big step for us. You know, it's a group of 15 volunteers and we put a lot of time in this, but the truth is to move these kinds of things forward, it really is going to take paid staff. And I, I just want to say, like, if you know John, you know John's the perfect choice for this position. And we had over 60 applicants for this job, from, peeps from out of state, from out of the country, uh, people who were really attracted to the idea of, you know, a capital city that could be a leader in resilience and recovery in a time of climate change. And um we had a really tough decision, but we we got the right person, and that feels really great. What we're working on right now, um, and we have a meeting on tomorrow, is developing a kind of initial slate of of projects. We're broken into various working groups, one on watershed management, one on emergency response, one on an adaptive downtown. Each one of those groups has been identifying like potential projects that this commission could could move forward. 
but trying to think comprehensively of like here's a slate of projects not just like a one one off kind of thing and so what we're trying to do is uh, put together that slate and um, think comprehensively about it and then what we'll be doing is once we we've kind of developed that slate we're going to crosswalk it with city staff and with folks like the regional planning commission and with other partners to kind of truth test it and to make sure we're not doing something redundant or at cross purposes and then we have a public meeting scheduled for May 23rd with the idea is to kind of share this in kind of draft form of like, these are the things that we picked. These are the kinds of why we picked them. This is how they go together. Some of them are going to be short-term easy wins. Some of them are going to be long-term things. It's just going to be that, that, that kind of mix. Um, you know, the other thing I would just say too is while all that kind of organizational and thought work has been going on, we've also been trying to really, um, provide leadership or action on kind of things that have come up organically. So those are things like the post office in terms of advocating for the return of the post office and just kind of banging the drum on that. Um, the other one that I think I spoke about briefly uh, is as a result of the commission, really, we've been able to put some partners together to move along the five home farmway project, um, which uh, I think is actually going really well. I, I think it'll be a future meeting when I give you a kind of final update, but we did receive a grant, and by we, I actually mean the Preservation Trustee Organization I work for, um, to uh, from Vermont Emergency Management to take down the, the, the historic but blighted property that's there and do the pre-engineering for a comprehensive flood plain reconnection project for the entire 18 acres, um, which, you know, we we don't know exactly what that what that'll mean in flood reduction, but we'll hope that it's significant and we'll know, um, you know, through engineering studies. Also, just doing some um, work around uh, emergency response planning. You know, obviously the city has a, a really strong um, continuance of operations plan and and has a structure in place. We've um, been exploring with folks like AARP and other consultants about is there a way to make that kind of more comprehensive so that it's and and is there a way to like practice it for folks like your businesses or volunteers or kind of thinking as an entire community about how do we respond together when this happens. Um, so that works going on. I, I believe actually some of our team uh, met with city staff today and um, it feels like there's some really promising opportunities in that area that we'll be reporting back on. And then the last thing I would just say that has kind of come up in advance of this kind of slate of projects is, you know, I, I think it became very clear early on that there was a kind of um, a gap, you know, that the commission, it was kind of formed with this idea of like long term visioning and projects around resiliency. But there's also an immediate need for our neighbors that are still to this day. Um, really struggling. And, you know, many communities across Vermont, both during Irene and this recent flooding event, um, who created long-term recovery groups that are really focused on individual assistance and unmet needs. So folks that honestly, like this week, like need a new mattress, right? Or uh, need some help on back rent to stay in their place. Um, things like that. And, um, you know, places, there's there's good work being done by FEMA, there's good work being done by Capstone, but when there are gaps here that our neighbors need to fill. Um, and so that's not really the work of the, of the commission. We're thinking differently, but we recognize that need. So we um, really tried to provide some leadership to initiate a long-term recovery group, which is the Disaster Recovery Network that is stood up. Suzanne Laguerre Belcher, who I'm sure many of you know, is really providing some leadership to that group and doing a great job. We've also been able to secure some um, funding from um, Catholic Charities, um, the Vermont Community Foundation, Montpelier Foundation, um, to really kind of help with those kind of un unmet needs. It's not a ton of money, but it's enough to, you know, meet some some stuff. And then the last thing, I'm sorry, I just have to, I really do have to say this, like, the, the well, other kind of thing that we did for this commission is raise all the money for it. Um, you know, John is not working for free. And uh, we were able mm -hmm. to raise his um, a salary and expenses for the commission for two years through the generosity of folks like the Montpelier Foundation that Tim serves on. Union Mutual was incredibly supportive, as was Vermont Mutual, National Life, the Vermont Community Foundation. It was a real team effort, and I think people recognized both the need and the opportunity here to do something really great. And, um, you know, I feel like we have a really wonderful team and the opportunities here, and we have the leader that we need, and um, really look forward to the partnership to, to do some good work. And with that, I'm going to just kind of turn it over to John to introduce himself and his, uh, his plans. <laughs> <laughs> plans uh uh thank you ben uh for the kind words and really um i'm 
thrilled to be here uh, with this new role uh, in the town that uh, I live in with my family. Uh, we've been here. I mean, I've I've been a resident of Montpelier probably since uh, you know early 2000s. We've been homeowners up on Cliff Street since 2008. Um, I have two kids in middle school at the moment and a kid who graduated Montpelier High School. So uh, this town uh, means uh, the world to us, and the opportunity to do this work is really um, important. You know, I I bring just to give you a very quick sense of where I come from. Uh, currently, uh, have been working at an old folks home, a great little nonprofit bike shop up in Burlington. But before that, worked at the Council on Rural Development for about five years, uh, running a program called the Climate Economy Model Communities Program. We we went town to town around Vermont, having conversations about resilience, about the future, identifying priorities, and then really thinking uh, with those communities about how to get those things done. And I think that's very much what we're doing uh, and what we will be doing as a, as a commission is really trying to drive forward with, uh, with a set of priorities. But I guess uh, what I'll say, and I'm so new at this that thanks for uh, I, I won't go on too long at this point, right? I'm, I'm brand new here. I, I, uh, I'm really looking forward to digging into things. But as I think about the partnership with the commission and the city itself, A, I think it's really critical. It's so so important. And I guess there's sort of three C words that come come to mind for me. First one would just be communicate. Like really, I'm looking forward to getting my feet under me and just engaging sort of with frequency and depth and really being a listener in those conversations, really having uh, regular conversations. And that's definitely with city staff, but also with you all as, as counselors as well. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second word, and I think Ben already alluded to this, is really trying to figure out how the commission complements the work of the city. Like that, that to me seems, uh, how do we make sure we're not overlapping and that we're really uh, supplementing and additive to all of the work that you all are doing uh, at, at the city level? How do we provide support to that and then track some of our own projects as well in a complementary way? And then finally, like I think uh, it goes without saying, but really being a collaborative partner uh, in, in that work. I think we, there's... I mean, just listening to what lies before you in terms of these city buildings, it's sort of, it's uh, breathtaking the scope of the work that lies ahead. Even if funding is, is not a challenge, just the technical challenges and demands that will be on you as a council or, uh, and you as, as staff is, uh, is huge. And so I think for us as a commission, it's really about how do we supplement and collaborate and really support that work you're doing and try to identify other other priorities that we can we can take a lead on. So uh, I will sort of transition into this role over the course of of May, really. So uh, it's my intention to really connect with you all as I get my feet under me. But I'm really looking forward to that partnership and collaboration uh, as we get going. Thanks, John. And I should, just the last thing I want to say, too, is, of course, Lauren serves on the council um, or the commission and the council. Um, and uh, that's just really important. So happy to answer any questions or um, no, you have a. Uh, welcome, John. And I just say that, you know, I think I speak for the city staff that we really appreciate the work of the commission. You know, you can see all the things that we have going. So the fact that there's a group that's focused on some of these larger external things that we can work together with you on. I know some, it seems like people keep wanting to circle to make sure we're working together and we are, and uh, yeah. Yeah, we really value the work that, that you're doing and appreciate that you're taking it on. Um, thinking of the presentation we just saw, and I know this is early, but in, and I wouldn't ask you to name specific project, but do you have projects in your queue that would be, that would sort of tie up that need the kind of engineering help that they're talking about? I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Like I'll just use a theoretical example, like the five home farmway project, the grant that we received, we've already received, we'll do the pre-engineering on that flood plane reconnection. Right. But my hope, and I think our hope is a project like that is really like a domino mm -hmm. that ticks off other properties along the watershed in that corridor. The grant doesn't cover pre-engineering for that kind of stuff, right? Or much less like restoration. So I think that there, you know, that's just like one example, 
like we're, we have a whole group dedicated to watershed that's looking for opportunities like that, that I'm sure that that kind of funding will be um, really important. The other thing I just want to say about the Regional Planning Commission that's so important as a partner is what's happening in Marshfield, what's happening in Plainfield, what's happening in Cabot is impacting us, right? And like what happens here impacts people in middle, like it's, we're not going to solve this problem in Montpelier alone, right? So anyway, I just want to really commend their leadership too, and thinking on a holistic kind of level, and we're excited to plug in in a supportive way on that work. Well, you know, knowing knowing the groups that you have, the adapt, you know, adaptive downtown and in the watershed and looking at what they're talking about, you know, yeah. flood proofing buildings and all those kind of things. Totally. It's like, boy, well, if, I, if there's ever groups that should yeah. be talking. I'll give you one. I will give you one specific example. Lauren, like, cut me off. This is premature. But, like, everybody seems pretty enthusiastic about it. It's just an idea of, like, really looking at, um, like, like um, Stevens and Associates, right? They, what they did for your public buildings is fantastic. And actually, at the Preservation Trust, we worked with them on a couple of historic buildings here in downtown to do the same kind of flood mitigation strategy work. But, you know, there are 100 buildings in the downtown corridor or, you know, that were impacted by flooding. All of them ultimately need a strategy like that. And, you know, we think about the idea of what if you could actually have an initiative or pursue grant funding that could help do some kind of comprehensive assessment of your downtown? Right. And, you know, the economy of scale that comes with that. And, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think are possible, you know, and whether or not that becomes a priority that we work on remains to be seen. But like those are the kinds of things that we're thinking about and the kinds of opportunities that we're talking about with the Regional Planning Commission, I think, could dovetail with that nicely. Thank you. OK, anybody? Lauren. I mean, first of all, just the amount of hours and work. Um, the commission's been doing has been awesome and the partnership I mean it's I'm so glad that uh, the commission is existing and taking its work really seriously and having John on board is going to be a huge boost to those efforts um, I guess just my question to the council as the liaison so we've got you know at the point of having a long list of projects trying to do the work of thoughtful prioritization of what makes sense for the commission to focus on I think even that long list feeding to our RPC friends makes sense because there might be some that don't make sense for us to pri prioritize, but might make sense for them to prioritize. Um, so I think like that kind of work can happen, but also just wanting to know for you all, like how in the weeds do you want to get, or do you want to, like, obviously there's this May 23rd, 6.30 PM senior center, be there. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so like, that'll be a great place to see. But I think obviously if there's interest here to get a, a more detailed or to have a, a separate, you know, time or something, if people wanted to kind of wonk out on the other ideas, I think I would just knowing that there is such important partnership on so many of them um, with the city. So just, I think maybe think about it and we could talk in the future about how, I mean, welcome ideas right now, but we can also, obviously it can be an ongoing conversation, but just want to make sure that between city staff and the counselors that you're all getting the information that you need to be feel informed and excited and that we're all rowing in the same direction. Adrian. Um, so just thinking about the current state, so how do you currently share information with the city staff and the council besides these updates and us attending your meetings? Um, I would say I, I meet with Bill probably more than he wants. <laughs> and. Josh, Josh Jerome, I'm really in um, pretty frequent contact um, with Josh, who's fantastic. Uh, we also put out um, monthly updates, you know, that just like uh, they, they go out on Front Porch Forum. They're up on our, we have a website, MontpelierStrong.org. All these kinds of updates are posted there. Um, and um, yeah, I'd say that was really it. Like we have these kind of monthly updates. We do the public forums quarterly. Uh, we're happy to come here when, you know, whenever there's time on the agenda or interest in us. Um, and I would also say we're like pretty accessible. I mean, we're, it's a group of volunteers, um, but we're, we're around, you know, and, um, and have, and, you know, John, I'll take your call. Also, so they do their updates and then we put them out on the city's website as well. And, you know, Ben does have my cell number and, we, and uses it. Uh, and, and I don't mean that in a bad way. We've had many you know, talks. And I think once John is up and running, I probably end up being here. 
Um, so I imagine we'll be having very regular communication. So uh, we'll have him in the basement. Uh, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Plus my weekly conversations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Plus my weekly conversations with Ben at Shaw's. There he is. <laughs> yeah, true. We don't have to make an appointment. We're just there. Yeah. <laughs> Strangely, it's true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, thanks so much so for much. your work. Keep, uh, thanks for your work. This is great. All right. River Hazard Ordinance Amendment. Public hearing. And Mike, while you're getting set up, I will uh, open the public hearing. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Council. So, um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, and I'll just reiterate it uh, really quickly, it's unusual for the for us to come back so quickly with an amendment to uh, to a set of ordinances that we just passed, probably eight weeks ago now. But um, we keep an eye on permits as they come in, and. Um, because we've been working so aggressively with uh, the state legislature about elevating all of our buildings, uh, our goal, the goal of the, the office, the planning office, is that we were, uh, our phase one approach is really to target all of the residential properties that received flooding into their first floor. And our goal is to try to elevate all of those buildings, get funding to elevate those buildings, so that way, if we had a flood similar to what we had last July, that we wouldn't have to have anybody displaced and no one would need to rely on FEMA or their housing because we recognize that they didn't go very well for most of the folks. So if we could find a way of doing that, we would be really setting up the, the community to be a much more resilient community. And it turns out there are only about 12 buildings, 13 buildings that had residential buildings that had flooding into their first floor. Um, 12 of them were working with the state to go through and elevate. One of them were working with our congressional delegation. That's a bigger building. That's the North Branch Apartments owned by Down Street. That needs a lot of money to elevate. So we're, we've got a separate, separate allocation for that one. Um, but really, those would be about 13 buildings that we've identified that would need to be elevated. Um, what we didn't realize was there was a loophole in our regulations, our river hazard regulations that would allow non-conforming commercial development to be converted into residential spaces. Uh, and we found that out when some permits were issued to, um, to allow that to happen. So uh, we also had two more buildings that were sold to people who have the intention of putting residential units into them. And so we uh, warned a, an emergency interim uh, set of regulations and it's relatively simple. It's, you know, the highlighted portion that that's in your staff report that really just goes and says that uh, the conversion of non-conforming non-residential space to residential space is prohibited unless that residential space and all attendant utilities are in conformity with the same requirements as new and substantially improved residential structures in section 804.A. So that just says you're going to have to come in. You go, you'll have to bring the property into conformance. So, um and so the intention is we didn't want to go through and spend $2 million elevating 13 buildings and then have three, four, five new ones come into existence without at least letting council have the opportunity to have the conversation of whether or not we want to go and prohibit it. If you don't pass the amendment, uh, that's fine. This is not an NFIP requirement. It would just mean that these conversions would be allowed to continue. But if you want to prohibit them, this language gives you that opportunity to go through and have those prohibited. Um, we want to point out anyone who did get applications, did get permits, they, everything's legal, everything's fine. That's, we, we're not trying to cast any aspersions on anyone who, who did do a project, um, one of those few projects that did go through. Um, but we did want to take that opportunity to say, I don't know if this is necessarily a good idea for us to continue down this path of having more. So and I guess I'll leave that open to you guys. All right, Professor. thank you. Um, since this is a, a public hearing, I'll see if there are any members of the public who want to be heard either in the room or uh, uh, on on Zoom.
not seeing anybody uh, seeking to be recognized. So I'll close the public hearing. Uh, council members, what are your thoughts? So, uh, so Mike, um, I'm not clear on on the existing the projects that are permitted. I mean, are are some of them underway or com already completed, or where where are they, and and how would this affect them? Uh, so it won't this won't affect the two that were already approved. They're over on Elm Street. Um, uh, Uncommon Market has been converted to residential. I was and, thinking maybe that was the one, yeah. And uh, Hippie Chickpea. So those the first two buildings, really. Those two buildings yeah. were were converted. As I said, we uh, at the time uh, we weren't aware of it. There's a lot of things that they aren't allowed to do. Um, it's a, if it was a conforming commercial building, it wouldn't be allowed to be converted. It just happens to be if it's a non-conforming commercial building. It's one of the little loopholes that didn't get covered. So, and and there are there are other permits in the pipeline, or uh, there's one permit in the pipeline. It's been appealed to the DRB. Um, obviously, if this doesn't become uh, doesn't become law, then that appeal will go forward, and we'll review that appeal on its merits. The DRB will will take that up. Okay. Any other, Kent, Tim? I'm trying to follow the non-conforming piece is what I'm trying to understand, like which properties really are impacted. And as I look around, I think there are quite a few, um, many of which were residential. At some point, became commercial in history when that was a need. Now it seems like the tide has shifted back, and there's more residential need. Um, I, I think we need to be really careful with this piece because I make make sure we understand what we're really doing here, how many properties we're going to impact and what those impacts could be. Um, I, I appreciate the staff's uh, sensitivity to it and bringing it to our attention, but I, I'm really feeling like we could do a lot of damage with this. And I don't think there were just 12 properties or 13 that had water in the main floors. For, uh, for residential residential units. I, um, I'm telling you, I think you're okay. Right. And if it's if it's yeah. true, that's great. We want to know all all of the all of the buildings because if we had more yeah, residential more. buildings, we would certainly put them on the list of people to try to get elevated. Uh, we certainly tried to do a lot of outreach to identify all of them that we could. Tim, do you have any examples of what you think the what what you're concerned about? Right to talk about people's properties. <laughs> public meeting, but uh, I mean, I just kind of, you know, where I live on Main Street and I, I kind of just look across the street, you know, there's a that brick house that was a law firm for years. I mean, certainly highest and best use, in my opinion, for that is residential. Um, how, how would that fare under this ordinance? If... Uh, yeah, it would depend. The question would be, did it get flooding into the first floor? And if the answer is yes, then then they would have to elevate the first floor. Everything through there did, Mike. Yeah. Oh no, I recognize. <laughs> I, I recognize that. Um, and as I said, the 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 concern that we had specifically about the the difference between the impact on a residential property and the impact on a commercial property is simply that the displacement factor of um, you know having commercial property that gets um, flooded, uh, people still have a place to live. Uh, we've got to relocate, find another place to set up employment, but that's different than um, having more people that we have to go and rely on FEMA to go and find new housing for. And but you're right. There's a, yes. There's a bunch of, uh, of those big old houses on Main Street that were houses at one point. Now they're offices, and those would be effective um, affected on, across the river on Elm Street. Some on the same state. thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I guess I just come back to, don't we want, if we're building new housing, it to be resilient to future flooding? Like, I don't really want to be encouraging development done in a way that's going to put new homeowners or renters at risk, which I think that's the goal of this, right? Mike is like that you would just it's not saying you can't do it it's saying you have to meet different standards you, and it could be really expensive yeah it could be expensive elevating a building not talking about a big brick 
historic building, but you know, um, most of the buildings we've been talking about are between 140 and 200,000 to elevate them. So, but it it might mean that somebody could be like, maybe I want to keep the first floor commercial, but I could still um, renovate my second floor into housing or something. So, I mean, yeah, it just doesn't seem very forward looking to be kind of encouraging development in places that are likely to flood again for housing to me. So to be clear, it wouldn't affect, let's say, the French block that we're coming in as a proposal because that's not flooding into the first floor. Just because there is flooding in the first floor doesn't prohibit somebody from putting residential into the second and third floors of a building. But it would, this would block somebody from, as Tim pointed out, you know, uh, the, the the law offices and that section of Main Street would would not be allowed to be converted to residential without either elevating the floor or elevating the entire building. Okay. So just to stick with that example, um, if the first floor were commercial and above it were residential, would that, that be allowed? That would be fine. Yeah. That would be fine. So they could, if, if you could keep offices in the first floor, have housing in the second and third floors. Correct. Without elevating the building. Without elevating the building. Yeah, it's it's the only requirement is to, you can't convert the space that is in the first floor. Right. Okay. I'll just respond to Lauren. I think I'm just trying to picture in my head and bring this to life. And so if I go down Main Street and those beautiful houses all turn back to residential homes and we have a flood again, all those people are not going to have a place to live. And we're going to have to go through this whole process of FEMA elevations, buyouts. Like, it seems like a nightmare. And so I think this solution will help prevent that, like, what we're living right now. So I, I think this is a good idea. I mean, this is what we're working towards. This is the whole goal, I think, right? No? None of these people got FEMA help by the way. Right, as far as you know. None of these people have gone in for any kind of assistance. The the commercial owners, yeah, I don't, I I'm I haven't been. I just people in, in these houses on Main Street. I'm one. Um, no, because did you really looking at the whole um, system? It's it's pretty heavy handed once you step into it. I think a lot of people have just dealt with their properties, and not called you, um, and not called FEMA for help. So the burden is on individuals and not necessarily a huge social burden. That the picture may be painted as. So, well, I, I mean, there are still people who are un, unhoused because of the flood. You know, they, I mean, I know people who lost their car and so couldn't get to work, so lost their job and so lost their apartment. Mm -hmm. um, I also just spent six months uh, reducing people's assessments and abating their taxes because of flood damage. It just doesn't make sense to me to encourage encourage that in the future. Um, we we don't allow it for new buildings. Um, I think a conversion is, I mean, it's not exactly the same thing, but um, the same principles apply, in my opinion. So framing this up for action, um, is this uh, one of those things that we need two public hearings for? Because, or no, just one? Nope. This because it technically falls under the interim regulations, uh, special provisions that are under the zoning. It requires one public hearing. So at this point, is if someone someone could move to adopt this proposed regulation, and we could vote on it tonight. Yes. Okay. And does someone want to make that motion? I will move that we um, we amend the regulation as um, proposed. Is there a second? Any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. All right, we've adopted the regulation. Thanks, Mike. Okay, thank you. And so this will be interim. It's in effect for two years. And, um, but we expect we'll be back at a later date to make a, 
put it back on as a permanent adoption. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Chris, we can get your update in by uh, done by eight thirty, right? <laughs> then we'll we'll take you before the uh, before our break. So come on up. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good I'm, evening. I'm Chris Lumber. I think most of you may know who I am. I'm facility sustainability and facilities coordinator. And I wanted to give you an update on what we've been working on. And there we are. We have it. Okay, um, so we're gonna kind of look at some of the current projects we've got going, uh, challenges, opportunities, and kind of open it up for questions and give you an update on net zero at the end. Uh, Great. <clears throat> so here's a job description of, of my title and I'm responsible for you know, moving the city toward our net, net zero goals, as well as um, trying to tackle some of our facilities issues, which are, um, I think, as as some of you know, many of you longer serving people that, uh, you know, we've got literally decades of deferred maintenance and most of our city facilities that are going to require kind of a, a strategic approach to get caught up on and deal with. So we've got uh, quite a few, quite a few little projects going here, um, and some of you are are more aware than others. Um, a big project that uh, has come our way. Uh, well, I'll I'll back up a second. Uh, one of the uh, really helpful things that's come to me from working with the Energy Committee is kind of a standing relationship with Efficiency Vermont, um, and that that partnership has just born fruit in so many ways already. Um, and they they led us to the uh, the thermal thermal storage grant that we're pursuing from uh, the Department of Energy. Um, that was also helped by the uh, feasibility study that we performed with Gostens Bachman early in 2023 that kind of really pulled together a lot of the background information that the DOE was looking for. Um, the, the goal of this grant is uh, to give the, the U.S. Department of Energy an opportunity to study similar buildings with similar heating systems with or without thermal storage. Um, and the, the heating systems for these buildings <clears throat> are going to be... Um, Air, air to water heat pumps. So they're they're cold climate heat pumps, but they'll they're not air to air. They're not the typical mini splits, and they'll be a hot water distribution system. Um, it is my understanding that they they have an eye on our rec center building for one of the models that will have thermal storage. I think the storage medium will be water. Um, it's been a slow moving grant approval process. But uh, just just in the past week, we've been asked to provide more documentation. They wanted kind of detailed photos of the mechanical spaces there um, to, I, I think, conceptualize how they're going to site all the equipment in there. Uh, this is part of an environmental study that they're performing. <clears throat> and Efficiency Vermont has prepared the subgrant agreement that, that goes along with this in parallel with the DOE review of this project which um is is a very promising sign to my eyes and also my my liaison at efficiency vermont agrees that they're they are continuing to move forward in a positive way with with this approval um 
so uh, another another nice project that's uh, come our way. This is actually another partnership from from the Energy Committee with uh, Regional Planning Commission, um, and Sam Lash is our liaison there. Um, Vermont Building General Services has municipal energy resiliency project grants that they're they're rolling out. <clears throat> And this is uh it's a three-step rollout on this. The first step was um was a very simple application that uh yielded us a four thousand dollar grant. They call it a mini grant, step one to kind of get your foot in the door with the with the MERP process. And that that little four thousand dollar grant was applied toward engineering for the uh phase two solid drying project at the water resource recovery facility. Second step of the of the MERP program is uh, comprehensive uh, free energy assessments of city buildings, and those were performed at the rec center and at two buildings on the on the DPW campus at both the equipment barn and the offices and repair shop. There, those were performed three week three weeks ago, I believe, two or three weeks ago. Um, and we are currently waiting for the final reports from that. Mm -hmm. uh, once that is complete, then that makes us eligible to apply for a, a quarter million dollar grant to hopefully implement some of the recommendations that come out of these assessments. More, uh, more to come on that. I think uh, one thing, uh, one thing that may may slightly work against us in this in the final grant with this is that um these MERP grants are really they're really trying to target uh communities with more disadvantaged um residents right so we're we're not necessarily that demographic but the 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 caveat on that is that uh at least conversationally with with regional planning unfortunately the the communities that may benefit most from this or maybe most closely targeted by this are the smaller communities that don't have the staff to really really go after the stuff so we'll just have to wait and see on that oh and oh uh back to the back to the rec center one one thing i did want to uh note on that this will uh if this all comes to pass this will displace about seven thousand gallons per year of of oil usage in that building which rough numbers represents about 28 percent of our of our heating load uh, fossil fuel usage at this point uh, we're also uh working on an, a citywide led lighting conversion project <clears throat> um and this again efficiency vermont came through for us uh, and they granted us approximately twenty three thousand dollars to purchase led bulbs for every every fixture in every city building um, and these are being installed using um, the revolving loan fund that, that's administered by the energy committee this project um, is i think it saves about fifteen thousand dollars a year in electrical use um, which yields uh, a simple payback of about a year and a year and three months or something and over the 17 year life of the of the light fixtures we're putting in or the, the lamps actually not fixtures will will capture almost a quarter million dollars in electrical savings from this project this project was uh it was really stalled by the by the flooding you know i don't have to tell anybody in this room how how deep the impacts were to all city operations but um the same electrical contractor who's performing these lighting conversion installations was also really an instrumental partner in restoring pump stations and restoring district heat controls and pumps and all the stuff in the basement that we had to get done in order to get to get the building back up and running before heating season so the the emergency work has been completed and he's really been able to turn turn his crew's attention to this project and uh as of i think my last check-in was last friday 
we're about 34% complete with this citywide. Uh, so uh, the fire station is 100% complete. The police station is 100% complete. The equipment barn at the at the DPW campus is 100% complete. Um, the garage and shop over there would be 100% complete if we didn't have a, a failure of the lift that's needed to put the fixtures in the highest highest part of the repair bays. But the, that's 95% complete and will be completed very quickly once that lift becomes available again. Um, next building that they're going to tackle uh, will be the water resource recovery facility or, or next facility, actually, not just building multiple buildings there. Um, and just a little bit amusing to me, the reason they're tackling that next is because it starts to smell worse as it, as the temperature comes up. So they want to, mm -hmm. they want to get down there and get out. <laughs> uh, we're also uh, we're working on trying to expand usership of, of district heat. Um, again, partnering with Efficiency Vermont. Um, we've asked them to perform some kind of high level engineering for us to help with this. And that, that um, the engineering work that they're performing for us will help us hopefully uh, partner with Clean Energy Development Fund, as well as Forest Parks and Recreation to get additional money that we can use to expand district heat. Uh, another another big project that's that's called out in the net zero plan is a uh, fuel switch for the uh, the two buildings at the district heat or at the I'm sorry the the DPW campus <clears throat> and this uh, this particular project really dovetails with um, biogas production from uh, wastewater treatment um, and we. We had some trouble with metering and, and data collection on that and uh, really weren't sure how much biogas we, excess biogas we had. The, the metering and data collection, <clears throat> uh, we got the bugs worked out of that this, this last year. And um, unfortunately, at the at current state, we really don't have any excess excess biogas on on the coldest heating days. Like the the flare gas just goes to zero when the temperature really drops over there. Um, uh, several factors kind of inform that. Uh, one is that the you know the the streams of high strength waste that were were really projected to be available that that would generate this high strength or generate the the higher levels of biogas are just not as readily available as as we were led to believe when the, the phase one project was designed and built. Um, uh, DPW and our, our chief operator at the at the treatment plant are trying to source more high strength waste that hopefully could contribute to additional gas production. Um, the design of the phase two will inform Again, how much how much excess gas is available, and there is um, Kurt has just informed me that they're um, they also received another uh, a twelve thousand dollar grant from Efficiency Vermont to do some engineering studies on um, air exchanges for the buildings over there, and it, I th I think we've come to the realization that we're just moving way too much air through those buildings and much more than is required. And uh, Kurt is hoping for a 75% reduction in, in air changes in those buildings, which would be a substantial decrease in the heating load there. So more to come on that. We've got that marked as paused. So there's there's a lot of moving pieces that have to come together to really fully understand this. Um, so we had our, um, our report from Stevens and Associates on the, on the rebuild and resiliency of this building, fire station, and police department. I think uh, we're moving towards a pretty, pretty clear understanding of that. Yes. Just curious, kind of to t Tim's question earlier. As the, our person who runs District Heat, why do we need? I know we're trying to get off of fossil fuels. Why do we need to put in a new fossil fuel boiler? We have some requirement in our 
here uh, in contract for city hall city hall yeah oh as the generator or so that's um kurt kurt's the one who's really kind of flagged this but it's if something ever happened and district heat went down then this this the boilers in this building would heat our buildings and they would be able to provide kind of back feed minimal heat into the system to hopefully be able to prevent our customers from having building freeze ups if there was some kind of extended outage that that's the rationale so, so we're not using them it's just a like emergency generator kind of system absolutely yeah okay. they're 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 also originally planned to be the source of summer off-season hot water you know the state plant runs for five months and we we're anticipating a 12-month loop um but most of our customers don't really rely on us for hot water uh and so we found it was actually made more sense financially to pay to have hot water heaters put in buildings than it was to run oil heat all summer to, to keep our you know our water up at a certain temperature but that that was the design so we're trying to figure out a better way to do all that yeah and uh so this this winter at the beginning of the heating season we weren't able to get district heat water to this building we weren't able our, our circulators were were down and we had kind of lead time issues getting those pumps replaced and we did rely on the boilers to heat city hall and the fire station for a few weeks at the beginning of the heating season so it's it's kind of a redundancy it, it's definitely a redundancy under normal circumstances those boilers don't fire and it's not if we're getting FEMA money it couldn't be heat pump systems put in instead it's not like it would have to be multiple buildings that were all covered by this generator but is that a possibility I think it really depends whether we're using so I, I'm way above my technical knowledge here but I think if we're simply to heat this building and the fire station and then you know, we could probably do you know localized systems if it was if we need to be able to provide heat to the district heat system, it would need a larger heat source. You know, could it be pellets or something like that? I don't know. It's an interesting question, Lauren, and and I think uh, I think for future conversation, Stevens and Associates and their their mechanical electrical engineers would will we'll pose the question and find out what's what's available for options. Um, so uh ev chargers we're um we ha we the city have not installed any any ev chargers yet uh i think as as everybody remembers through through the budget season that uh we are not yet able to roll out any electric vehicles we don't we don't have a need for chargers um as we kind of we're really exploring the options of the ev chargers it became clear that there's just there's really no electrical excess electrical capacity at city hall to to feed these feed these chargers um dpw uh where once once we start to roll out evs we'll we'll want to have dc fast chargers there as opposed to level two chargers there's not currently um three-phase power there i think that's about a Seventeen thousand dollar bill to to extend lines to get three phase power there, and again this this is going to work in conjunction with our capital plan as we as we really kind of look cohesively at the equipment replacement plan and we'll we'll roll out the chargers as as they become necessary for city operations. Um, so, Chris, as you were saying, there's no excess capacity at City Hall. Does that mean that? I don't know what the level of usage is for the one charger we have out back, but we would not have the capacity to put another one there, even if uh, there were sufficient demand for it. Not not directly powered from City Hall, no. I, it, it may be possible to power it directly from the grid there uh -huh. okay. and do something like that. Uh, and so currently there are three three EV chargers in this parking lot. There's two two charge points on the side of the the building at Picking Court there. There's the one public charger directly behind City Hall. Um, I have been um, 
kind of collaborating with Green Mountain Power and they are tracking to install um, two, two double DC fast chargers in the 12 to 16 Main Street lot, um, very near the pedestrian bridge. Um, latest update on that was that they are um, they're moving well with with engineering and permitting. Expect that to be done the end of May, early June. Um, but due to um, lead time supply chain issues, they won't have everything they need to have these things up and running until October. They're, so they're thinking middle of October, these things will, the DC fast chargers will be online okay. in the downtown. And um, Green Mountain Power has a really, really strong initiative that they they have a, they're really interested in getting these DC fast chargers really in in the centers of towns and villages and that type of thing. There's there's the one at the you know the first one over at the uh, credit union, but it's not centrally located, right? There's this the idea is that people can charge their cars in 40 minutes, and it's kind of just the right time to go over to Three Penny and have a beer and a beer and a burger and then come back and your car's fully charged and on your way you go. So hopefully it's a win for the downtown as well as for, for users of EVs. Right. Um, and then, uh, uh, so public restrooms been working with the public restroom committee. Uh, and so far we've, uh, we've replaced the, um, the two porta johns that were in place during COVID when the buildings were all closed one is kind of relocated back here behind city hall that was because of noise complaints from residents when it was at the at the very top of the parking lot that backs up to the apartments on downing street it kind of became a, a evening gathering place and people got got loud there so we we located it here and it seems to be okay there's it's not without issues certainly there's there's um a second one behind the uh senior center and that location is also fairly centrally located. Um, and as was noted some by some of our committee members, that that serves a real need for um, children to playground right next to it, parents, caregivers, that type of thing when when they're using that that playground nights and weekends, that type of thing. Um, so those are those are kind of the big projects we're working on. And I guess I've got a slide for each of those. I apologize. Got ahead of myself. Um, okay. And really, the text of that is all in my narrative. <laughs> so this is all the stuff that you told us about. Great. This is all the stuff. Mm -hmm. I, this is all yeah. the stuff I told you about. I, yeah. Great. Got a little bit ahead of myself. Um, uh, one one district heat I didn't. Uh, mention is that we do uh, we are still e exploring the possibility of a of a snow melt system that would be fired with district heat, um, and I think uh, I'm not I'm not sure how much Kurt introduced this this idea to the to the council, but it uh, it helps us with the with the loss of the stump dump for for snow storage. It gives us the opportunity to filter the snow melt or not, not just filter it, but send it to the treatment plant. And as opposed to it just naturally discharging to the waterways with salt and oil and whatever came off the road in it. Um, and it will save, it will save time during snow removal events. It will save vehicle fuel. Um, but um, so we're uh, next step of that is to kind of put together some kind of conceptual design to, um, share, share with, uh, buildings, general services to get them on board. They're, they're, they're a very necessary partner in this. Mm -hmm. They want to know more about what, what we've got in mind. Um, we do, uh, we're having regular internal meetings regarding district heat and, uh, th things we're working toward there, kind of reviewing our, our business plan and the contracts, both with the state and the customers. Um, trying to address the billing concerns from the customers. Uh, as you all know, the, the district heat controls within the individual customer buildings took a took a nasty hit during the flood. Um, 
not still not fully restored. We're we're working toward you know recovering the system and getting it back to normal operation and um, you know getting getting that really back online as it had functioned before. And we have prospects for customers to add to the system. We have we have a list that we're working on with Efficiency Vermont, yes, of of likely prospects and. Uh, again, they're they're doing some engineering, so we have accurate information to share with these customers at the front end. And um, the next step of that would be to <clears throat> perform, you know, building surveys with with the owner's agreement of of our most likely candidates. And you know that that's going to look at square footage and heating load of the building, current heating type, fuel usage, just fuel uh, heat distribution system. And just over overall suitability. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Council, any thoughts or any questions? Okay. I, I think I've got a couple more. Oh, okay. More points to hit here, Jack. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So we did hit restrooms. And, uh, yeah, so so overall progress toward the net zero plan. Um, so the the priority action items that that were called out in the net zero plan, um, two of the two of the top priority items in in net zero are full school projects that we really don't have we don't have a lever to move those right. It's um, and the the third. Uh, number one priority or top priority was, is the water treatment plant getting a pellet boiler up there and we're just we're not quite there yet we're we're really working more on on kind of the top two priority two items and and it's going to really displace a lot of fossil fuel in there um and those were the two the two projects i talked to you about the the doe thermal storage grant and the, the fuel switch at the um, at the DPW campus. Lauren. I just want to note also, I know um, the energy committee, there was a kind of focused effort to do outreach to the schools. And so Tim favorite on that um, ended up kind of becoming a liaison to the school board and they have been working through, they now have like a sustainability committee and like, there, so there, there's progress happening, even though, I don't think any of this has been is like actively underway, but I think they finally passed like a net zero commitment. And um, so they're kind of behind us in terms of process, but there, there have been things happening in the last um, year or so that kind of shook loose what had been um, just been a little stalled out for a while. So just Absolutely. wanted to share that. Thank Thanks for sharing that. Um. So we really hit on the opportunities here, uh, and you know the, the challenges are the are really the the same challenges we're facing citywide, right? It's staff capacity and you know flood recovery and and you know the the budget impacts of the flood uh, on the heels of COVID and prioritizing our our projects and our you know our capital needs and everything else and uh, you know available. Always, always comes down to money, right? Um, and that that does conclude my presentation. So, okay. So now the question is: Do we have questions? Other questions from the council, or questions or comments from the public? All right. Thanks, Chris. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, there goes my estimate of getting that through by 8.30, but it's time for our 10 minute break. I will call us back to order. Oh, it's nice having the full light, full light on. We can keep it on. Well, we'll see how it goes. I, I think there's not, there's probably more demand for it out on in Zoom world than here. So that's fine to keep it on. Unless anyone else really wants it. All right.
we are up to the resiliency item of the strategic plan. And you are good to go. All right, ready to go. Uh, Kelly Murphy, Assistant City Manager. So we've been bringing forward uh, each of the goals for the strategic plan and reviewing the initiatives. Um, and so a lot of these slides are um, just uh, duplicative of what we've already seen. So I'm just going to kind of cruise through things and give you an overview of where we're at. This one isn't as extensive as some of our other um, goals um, because there is overlap with some of our infrastructure uh, goals. And so I'll get into that as we get underway here. Um, so... There we go. Um, so here's the quick agenda, same as what we've been doing the past couple of weeks. Um, and the topic of this um, item is resiliency. Um, I also want to note two things. One, I just noted with overlap and some of the infrastructure category. And then um, when we report out on this in Invisio, we will be um, collapsing some of the items. So you won't see a duplication in the report. It'll just be under one item and likely whatever fits best. Um, and so most of them will be probably in infrastructure. Um, so well, you'll see that as we get through this. So just a reminder of where we're at, we're at the 30,000 foot level here as we're evaluating some of the initiatives and moving them forward. Um, this is an overview of um, all of the goals. Um, and so in the green there, that's where the resiliency goal is. Um, I did shorten the title. And so we are also considering, you know, good environmental practices and stewardship there as well, just to note that. Um, and then cruising on through here, um, we are on the third item down here. And so the prioritized strategies for this particular goal were to implement flood resiliency initiatives, implement city net zero energy policy, which we got a pretty good overview in the previous presentation. Um, and then from there, um, pursuing environmental improvement projects, which a lot of our infrastructure projects do have an element of environmental um, improvement. And so just cruising through, um, also I'll just note that I did hand out the goal itself, which was attached to the agenda packet, along with the quick summary, which we'll be reworking to kind of build out those timelines to kind of help prioritize as we have that discussion. Um, and so with this first uh, strategy, these are the initiatives to support resiliency commission and projects. Um, the projects are the FEMA projects. So you'll note that um, I mentioned in the infrastructure um, presentation that there are um, 44 individual projects on that list and about $11 million. That's an initial estimate. You saw some of that work tonight um, with the Stevens and Associates presentation. Um, and so that's just a sort of first initial pass. I do anticipate that that number will grow. Um, we are focused on finding funding um, for those projects. And so we're working with our state and federal partners to do so. Um, and then, you know, these are all just um, very summary level here. Um, but, you know, we're kind of working through working with our legislative delegation as well. Um, and so for the net zero, we're focused on the 2030 uh, plan and evaluating, you know, what things we've been able to kind of tick off the list, what things are next. Um, and so really of note there um, are the projects that are in the works for the DPW garage and also the recreation center um, on Berry Street. And then um, considering the electri electrification words this time, I don't know, um, of our fleet, you know what I mean. Um, uh, so we're working on that as well. And so there are some cost implications with doing that. And so as we bring forward the capital plan, we'll be taking those things into consideration and providing you with financial impact statements. Um, and so that's something that we mentioned in infrastructure, but also mentioned here as it relates to the net zero plan. So cruising on through here, these are um, some of the environmental improvement projects that are identified as initiatives. A lot of these you've already seen because they were listed in infrastructure. One of the items here, the protect and conserve natural water storage is something that's not called out specifically. And so as we get into the council policy or decision items, that item is called out so that then we report back to you on that. Um, so what's next? You've seen the slide before. I may just condense our future presentation so it's not redundant, but you know, really um, as we're working through these goals and initiatives, we're really kind of in this phase of a hard reset. And so taking stock in where we are and where we're going and establishing performance measures, um, and then you know, sort of providing you with those decision items. 
Um, and so these are the decision items It's relatively short because a lot of those items have already been identified as part of the infrastructure projects. But we've got a couple of critical projects here, such as the um, effluent ice melt project that, you know, is kind of mentioned in the infrastructure, but I wanted to highlight it. And then um, homeowner elevation. The other ones were pretty squarely in infrastructure, so I didn't mention them here as a future item. And then the net zero 2030 projects and equipment and then working on sort of to protect and conserve natural water storage. And so with that, that's what we've got for items. I can pause here to see um, if you've got any questions or you want to talk through anything. Yeah, could you talk a little more about the bypass effluent? Uh, sure. Stuff? So um, we currently do um, use this um, to work with ice melt, and it would be an expansion or extension of that effluent. Um, we have a system that uh, water that comes out of the wastewater treatment plant, the water resource recovery plant, is warmer than you know 32 degrees, even in the winter, because it's been processed and it's coming from wastewater systems. So we have a bypass uh, piping system that instead of having it go out onto the Dog River, it comes over to the Winooski. So it's piped under and it comes out and it's, we use that to melt out the ice. If you notice, in the, well, we didn't have any ice this winter, so we didn't have to use it. But assuming we have ice in the future, it kind of melts out a channel in the middle of the river, which then keeps it looser and allows it to break up. And, you know, has it worked? Well, we haven't had an ice jam blood since so I guess it's worked we don't you know you don't know whether prevention actually did it or not but it is working and um, it's been designed and we've been planning to actually bring it further up closer to about Bailey Avenue so that the, the ice melt has a longer run uh, so there's more and this would be we're seeking funding not in city budget necessarily but seeking funding through has hazardous mitigation grant funding you know we forget that I mean the, the 2011 flooding and the 2023 flooding were all these, you know, fluvial flooding weather events. But before that, in 92, it was an ice jam. And all of our all of our efforts had been up until 2011 was really, you know, what can we do to prevent and protect for ice jams? And then, you know, our awareness shifted a little bit, but we're we are still diligent. Um and again, we got a little break this winter, but I can tell you that in a normal winter, most of us are checking the river every single day uh, to see what the ice looks like. It just becomes kind of a thing. You go out to the store, you run down, you look at the river because you never know. So so it's a good good project and we're happy to be trying to finish it. You can't bring it up to our town. We should be able to the ice melt because it's it's, it you know, smells they, when you go by that outflow. Well, the the the, the, <laughs> the uh, Wait, just say oh the out outflow itself by the bike path. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're just gonna move that up, right? Right. Yeah. It does. <laughs> it smells less bad than flood water. Yes, I'll give you that. <laughs> Lauren. So just on the um the last bullet on the kind of more like watershed projects, just curious. Is that something that there's city staff that's focused on it, or is that something that it's really looking? I mean, I'm thinking, knowing like the commission, like we heard from earlier, has a lot of looking at projects and trying to tap into um, various expertise there. So is that more like looking to partner and have other groups be leading on, or is there something happening at the city? Um, so this is more, I think, of a partnership. I think this language was identified as um, an initiative when we were doing the review of the strategic plan this past fall. And so, you know, we put it in here and I wanted to highlight it so that then we can focus on it um, and make sure we do bring forward. And I, yeah, and I could see that there might be grants where the city would be at least a partner and stuff. So I think I think having it there is great. I just, that makes sense. And it's definitely a big priority of the commission. So um, great. Yeah. Snow melt options come up a few times now, and I, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, so I'll be curious to listen. But just to remind folks that the district heat, even though it uses wood pellets, also uses oil boilers and to warm the chips and melt the chips. And there's a fair amount of fossil fuel that goes down down there. So using that to melt snow, it just doesn't feel 
that responsible to me. It's good to note that. I mean, I think we are looking into it and we'll bring anything back um, as we look at the conceptual plans for that. Um, it's been one of those projects that's been on the radar and has been discussed and is something that's been considered, but clearly we do need more guidance too on that. For people that this is new to, this is not keeping the sidewalks dry. This is uh, melting snow where it's piled up from being plowed, right? Yes, that's correct. So, you know, if you go back to my beginning of my time and we had six or seven snow dumps around the city where DPW could take snow, including, well, even before my time, they just dumped it into the river. Um, that was the way most places got rid of their snow. They, obviously, that creates flooding issues, but also, the, you know, that snow has got salt, it's got oils, it's got, you know, asphalt, it's got all kinds of, you know, contaminants in it. So um, we had a bunch of uh, snow, uh, snow dumping sites. Most of them were on private locations that people either gave us permission or we leased. And over time, uh, they all pretty much have gone away uh, with the exception of the stump dump. Uh, which means that uh, when we're hauling snow, when we're doing snow removal, which we do in downtown, you know, we plow snow and then it gets piled up and then they come out and loaders lift and load the trucks and they carry the snow away. And it almost all goes to the stump dump. Uh, I think the only other location is under the the um, over mm -hmm. interstate bridge out on Route 2. So the only two places. And even that, we have to keep it a certain ways back from the river and we have to have a silt fence and all those kind of things to make sure it's you know, it's being protected for runoff into the river. So it's time consuming, it's, it's expensive. Um, so we need we need an efficient place to dump snow for snow removal operations. Obviously uh, th there are, you know, district heat isn't perfect. It is, and so I think the point is if it's being melted, then it is being melted, being sifted and then going through the treatment system. So it's not, Putting those contaminants into the river, and it's much faster. We, you know, we would part, we would do this in partnership with BGS and probably on their property because they do the same thing with their parking lot. So they need a place to dump their snow. So it would all go in, and it would take advantage of the heating system that we always have that's that's already running. So is it perfect? No, but there are there are advantages to it, um, including getting you know more use out of the district heat system. And providing a cost and need that really we something we have to do that we are rapidly running out of options to do. So it's 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 kind of it will eventually be key to providing a a prime service unless it actually stops snowing here. In which case, then um, is it waste heat or is it um, are we actually? It would be the what? district heat system. But but is it heat that's being generated? anyway yeah and, and yeah but it would be taking it, it is heat so it's being vented now or no some of no it? it's it's I'd, I'd probably want someone who understands the yeah. science of the system better but you know the the, the heat is a, a circle a hot water circulation and you can withdraw you can take heat from the system and then more heat goes in depending on what's being withdrawn mm -hmm. so it would be using heat and then more would go in from the general plant. So um, it would be within our capacity. So at some point, if we had more users of the heat, whether it's snow melt or buildings or whatever, it could require us to boil more chips, more pellets in the system, presumably. Well, you know, we don't- Because we pre yes, I generate mean, more hot water. Right, we have, we have purchased, you know, a, an amount of capacity, about a quarter of the plant. We have the right to use up to a quarter of the plant, and we are not using that. So uh, if we were to exceed that use, then there's provisions in the contract that we can buy more capacity in the plant. But the plant itself is only using about half of its total capacity. So, I, I, you know, so, the, you know, I, I don't think we're not worried about running out of the plant's ability to produce heat, but it would take more chips to do so. Just mm -hmm. like if you create more heat, you use more oil or whatever your source is. So just like in your house, if you added a, a couple of rooms to your house. Yeah, it's going to cost you more heat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how you heat it. Yep. Any other 
comments or questions from the council? All right, so um, this is just what's next. So the next goal that we're gonna be talking about is community prosperity. Um, so we'll have a lot of uh, community services, recreation, senior center and parks here to present on the 8th of May. Um, and then from there, we'll move on to public safety as goal number five. And then the last um, discussion point will be the administration um, and government services on 612. And after that meeting, we'll be reporting out on um, these goals and also sort of sharing the final report for the fiscal year with you. So we'll at least get one and zero report in and then work to build from there. And then at some, then around then you would be adopting finally the final version of the plan with whatever tweaks. Yes. You mm -hmm. Thanks Kelly. Thank nope. you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Question. So when you present the final version of the strategic plan, will it have those performance measures in it? Uh, yes, I hope that it will have some performance measures in it. Um, it will be a work in progress, um, just to kind of level set with that, because we do have some standards that we use that might not be called to the forefront, but, you know, we will be sort of identifying those. And then I hope to identify more so that, you know, we can really kind of um, show how we're doing. Tim. I mean, and the other thing, the strategic plan that we've worked through the process last year, and it was my first time working through it, is there really are no priorities in this thing. And I think that maybe something at the council retreat we can talk about is how to at least flag some way to prioritize it a bit to help guide this. Because really now it's just a nice long list. So I think for prioritization for any strategic plan, you need data. And so I think this is a long list of projects. That's why I was thinking like performance measures. But like when I think about like enhanced communication with legislative delegation, like what does that mean? Like, what do you want to get out of that? How many legislative delegations? Like what type of communication? Like it says complete LED lighting conversion and identified city building, city buildings. Like how many city buildings? Like what is the goal that you're trying to achieve? And then like every quarter, how do like an update on those numbers. And then by the end of the year, did you achieve those goals? Like there's so, no measurable numbers here. Yeah. So with those, those kind of things. So, you know, here's a quick comment on that. So we did, you, first of all, remind everyone that we had a very compressed fall due to flood and delays and everything else, but you all did select the five main goals and you had others and you voted and set those, and then you prioritize them in order. So we're presenting them to you in the priority order. And basically what we're saying to you is these are the projects and activities that would that we're working on that would support accomplishing the goals that you s wish to accomplish. Some of them are very, so I think, you know, the LED lighting, we know exactly how many fixtures there are. We could tell you that and say, you know, we've got, 50% of them done or whatever. That's some of these, you know, the projects it's either completed or it's not, or it's in design, or the, you know, some things are more ongoing, you know, I mean, I, I'm making this up, but you know, have a, have a safer community. Well, what does that look like? I mean, I think some of that's up to you all to say, here's how we think of this as a safer community. This is the, and, you know, so I, I you know, we're, it's, some of it's very measurable and some of it isn't. That's the nature of what we do. But, you know, to the extent that we can measure it and to the extent that you want to set hard goals like, you know, 500 new housing units in five years or something, like, great. That really gives us something to shoot for. Um, sometimes with a group, what we have is the best we can get. So um, we work with it. And that's why we, we're telling you, I mean, this is kind of the opportunity for us to say, you set five key priorities. This is what we're working on to accomplish your priorities. Are these the right things or are these the kinds of things? And, you know, we kind of prioritize unless, you know, you know, we kind of priority some of them and some of them take longer anyway. Um, so we, you know, I think one of the things we can put in is, you know, and we're working on that is the estimated time frame. Some things, you know, we know that, Seasonally, we only have a summer construction season, so we have this long list of projects, and then come November, you know, we'll say there's a bunch of them are done. Now they're off the list, and next year's projects will go on the list, and 
it's, you know, some these roads were paved. Now here's next year's roads to be paved. You know, there will always be those projects. It's just that the names change. And the example you gave about the uh, the conversion to LED lighting, well, Chris told us we have a contractor. The contractor is doing the relamping, and we're thirty four percent of the way done. So, <laughs> Palin. So I think I passed this a couple of times. Uh, will it be the right place to talk about flood uh, emergency response plan? So next item on the agenda. One. Yeah, so, um, okay, it was my question. <laughs> question and comments, <laughs> so we will talk about it. And Kelly, one other thing which has, has come up before and it's just worth asking, is all of this all of this that you talked about today within the capacity of staff to do? Yes. Because I know everybody who works for the city is working hard and has a lot to do. Okay. All right. Let's move right on. Thank you. While Evelyn is setting up, um, we uh, she's going to specifically report on our what we call our after action report. So after the flood, we uh, we debriefed ourselves and talked about what went well and what didn't go well, and what we could do better. And then uh, before we really had a chance to publish it, we had the December event, so we used a lot of the lessons learned, and then we did it again. Uh, so this is the compilation really of the two things. So, uh, but in addition, there is also uh, an emergency operations plan that we have to update every year. And that is kind of a, I don't want to say it's pro forma, but we do that with the regional planning commission. And a lot of that's just updating contact information. And then lastly, I just met with uh, the commission on recovery resilience. They are working on a more comprehensive emergency response plan, not just for the city, but for the community. So we will be partnering with them in some fashion, and we may even have a financial contribution to that, but I think it'd be a good investment. So, um, and obviously you would approve that. Uh, but, uh, so there's sort of three different responses that are all connected to one another. Um, so with that, let's turn it over to the expert. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction, Bill. Um, Evelyn Prim, Communications Coordinator for the City. Um, so yeah, thank you for distinguishing that this is not um, specifically uh, having to do with the emergency management plan. That's a whole separate four-hour presentation. Um, and so this is, yeah, this is specific to- Well, we've got time. Um, <laughs> right, it's not even 10 o'clock yet. Um, this is specific to um, how the- the, what is called an after action. Um, so that I'll go into the details on that, but it's it's specific to what we did in August of 2023 in response to how our uh, staff managed um, and responded to the uh, natural disaster that we had. All right. Um, so before we get into the, the details, and I will stay uh, religiously to my notes so we stay on time, um, I'll just briefly go over what an after action is and why it's important. We kind of already covered that, but I'll just I'll restate. Um, so the after action is a process where decision makers um, evaluate um, the response to an emer emergency event. Um, so in this case, the city of Montpelier department leaders assembled on August 23rd um, and analyzed the city's initial response to the flood, um, in particular, examining the actions during the first four weeks of uh, following the weekend of, Ju of July 10th. Um, and so after actions are important because uh, our job as public administrators and public managers are to serve the public to the best of our ability. And so it's our responsibility to take a critical eye on those actions and learn from our experiences um, and each other. Um, and that's what makes us a learning organization. Um, so an after action follows a distinct process. So as I said, we met on August 23rd um, we began by thinking and reflecting on on what just happened. Um, so at that weeks, at that point, it was about five weeks uh, since the flood, and we were all still in a little bit of shock and uh, riding on a lot of adrenaline. 
Um, and so we reflected on what went well, drilling down into very specific actions. So what went as planned? Where did we see positive feedback? Um, and so this became a list. Um, then we asked what needed improvement, uh, what didn't work as expected, where did we notice gaps or things that we hadn't anticipated. That became another list. Um, after that, as a group, we went through both lists and identified the corrective actions to the identified needs. Um, so the graphic on the left here coming up. Click through those. Um, so the gra graphic on the left left here uh, represents, there it is. Um, let's see, uh, represents one of the changes that we made um, in response to an identified action. Um, so at one point in the, in, uh, the weeks following the flood that uh, we heard uh, consistently that the city didn't put out enough information. And so we really took a critical eye on that and uh, explored what were some potential causes. And so one of the th things that we noted is that the city put out um, over 20 VT alerts during the first few days of the flood. Um, what we specifically did not include in those um, emergency updates was from the city of Montpelier. So people were getting the emergency alerts, they were taking the actions that they needed to do, but they just didn't know that the information was coming from the city. Um, so that in hindsight, that's a huge opportunity for us to then um, show that, you know, the city is doing things um, when it might not appear that that is the case. So that is a, a excellent learning experience um, and exactly why uh, an after action is important. Evelyn, on this point, um, did you hear from people that they didn't? have enough information because I think there's a difference between saying the city didn't give us enough information and we didn't have enough information. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so we, we heard both to a degree, but overwhelmingly it was the city specifically did not give us information. And um, at early on, we were putting out a lot of information to the business community through Montpelier Alive, for instance, this was another area of that was identified um, as a, as an area of improvement. Um, and so uh, it was again kind of an issue of of branding when people are receiving a message, and this is this is my entire bread and butter as the communications coordinators. When people are receiving a message, um, a, a huge component of that is knowing who you know who that message is coming from. And so we're making extra uh, intent to make sure that that is front and center in everything that we do going forward. Thanks. So, onto some areas of success that we noted here. And so I'll also mention that this goes in addition to a, uh, a few page report that is included in the packet. So that uh, it's this presentation in report form. So you can refer back to it. Um, volunteers over overwhelmingly was a, a huge area of success. Um, so volunteers and city staff who organized, who helped organize them uh, were by far the most visible part of our emergency response, especially in the, in those initial uh, weeks. Um, and it was an, it was a success for so many reasons, uh, but specifically department leaders noted the Herculean effort by the parks and trees staff that, uh, that did, they did to make this happen. Um, and it was because of their efforts that it was a tremendous success. Um, in addition to that, um, our emergency response training and readiness was identified as a major area of success. Um, and this is specifically to our, our public safety safety staff who prioritize training. Um, so you've heard from Chief Nordenson and Chief Gallons about the need to relo relocate uh, dispatch and the emergency operations center during the flood to the water treatment plant in Berlin. That's uh, shown here at, on this picture. That's um, our, our PD staff um, in a safety briefing um, one of the days um, immediately after the flood. Um, and so their efforts uh, seam seamlessly transferred operations without any service drops. Um, so fire and EMS teams also strategically pre-positioned pre emergency response crews throughout Montpelier to ensure citywide emergency coverage um, as the bridges became impassable. Um, this is another example of an activity that happens behind the scenes out of the public view. And so now that we're coming on to the uh, one, you know, coming up to the one year anniversary of the flood, um, like Bill mentioned, we in as we were putting together this report, we ended up going through another flood that we learned from. Um, and so that's why we thought that um, putting this here at, in the resiliency 
part of the strategic plan made a lot of sense. And as as Pellin noticed, this is a big uh, this, this is a big part of our our staff's um, ability to be resilient in the face of um, natural disasters. Um, so this, uh, yeah, so this interdependence um, was strengthened by regular training and disaster preparedness activities that we engage in uh, frequently. Um, so the, I mentioned the pre-positioning of fire and uh, EMS teams. This is a, a view of, uh, as you can see, some uh, emergency vehicles are on high ground while the downtown is is underwater. Um, And so our communications um, was also identified as a major area of success. Uh, so the city was able to communicate with the public continuously throughout the day and night during the onset of the flood through the crisis communications response team um, that I'll refer to as the CCRT. Uh, so the CCRT is a group of city staff, uh, one from each department who per perform the lion's share of the city's communications as part of their daily responsibilities. So we created this working group in March of 2023 and had prepared for exactly this type of an emergency event months before we had to make our first deployment uh, during the July flood. Um, so quite the quite the trial by fire, but we had prepared um, and we're so thankful that we did um, because it allowed us to hit the ground running um, immediately. Uh, so yeah, so having this team in place ahead of the flood allowed us to rapidly respond to the flood's emergency as we had prepared to do. Uh, the CCRT mobilized Monday morning at 5 a.m. Uh, with the deployment of the EOC and assisted with both of, uh, internal and external communications. Um, as you may remember, um, a lot of staff were still at home at 5 a.m. Um, and so getting information out to them that the downtown was being flooded was just as important as getting the information to the residents um, so that we could all respond um, to the best of our abilities without um, sacrificing any of any of our safety in order Just to do our jobs here we had staff that couldn't get here yeah including emergency staff because of their own homes and their roads i mean this wasn't a Montpelier only event so that was just added to the fun yeah absolutely um so in the days and weeks uh, preceding the ccrt facilitated the communications for the volunteer recruitment and deployment um, and helped in the debris removal process with fema um, and the Department of Public Works. And so these these pictures are just a couple of the uh, snapshots that we took during the the first few days of the flood and then the the debris diagram because that was uh, a, an enormous part of my of my work during the that process. Um, so now on to areas of improvement. So as we reviewed the areas identified for improvement, we noticed uh, corrective actions naturally fell into one of three major layers of actions. Um, the individual level, the uh, which includes individual city staff actions. Um, the organizational level, uh, which includes departments and working groups. Um, and the inter-organizational um, level uh, in actions. So again, collaborating, coordinating with um, NGOs, the, Business, businesses, the state, um, many of the groups you heard from today were, are part of that. And so some individual actions. Uh, so first there were, uh, so there's so several corrective actions that individuals and uh, city staff could take to improve our disaster response in the future. Um, they're itemized in the report that you have, uh, but an example of this is having each mem uh, staff member take uh, FEMA's National Incident, Incident Management System training, um, which is this flyer or the cover sheet there on the on the screen. Um, some organizational actions uh, could be something at the at the department level, for instance, um, and uh, such as flood proofing uh, the uh, water, wastewater resource recovery facility on Dog River Road, pictured there. Um, heard a lot about that tonight. Um, and also uh, formalizing our volunteer response unit as part of the city's emergency management plan. Um, so again, just some other examples included in the slides as well. And then for interorganizational actions. Um, yeah, collaborating with other towns, organizations, businesses, um, collaborating with other towns specifically. Uh, we have been doing more so uh, specifically around the eclipse and preparing for a, a potential emergency response, um, public safety 
hazard during that. Uh, so ha having those in these uh, items and actions identified early on have really helped us uh, inform our work over the last couple of months. Um, uh, another example of this is creating a digital emergency or a, a digital and physical emergency operations kit for, uh, for staff, specifically CCRT members who operate out of multiple locations. Um, that's something I'm working on right now. And again, also the uh, everything that has come out of the recovery and resiliency forums, um, including the commission and all the uh, stakeholder groups identified in that. So next steps where we go from here. Uh, so the report uh, that I mentioned lists 16 specific um, actions that were identified for implementation. Each has an assigned department responsible for seeing it through to completion. Um, we've also included a, compre a, a completion goal date. Um, some of these have already been implemented, um, as I mentioned, such as uh, creating a community updates distribution list through our website that we uh, utilized during the eclipse and um, among many other um, things. Uh, so some smaller um, action items are, uh, in, or some action items are inclusive of other smaller items, uh, such as updating the strategic communications plan um, that will be a separate presentation from me to you all uh, very soon. Um, and again, that, that details a, a whole host of, of items. So even though it's listed on the report as one item, it, it is a multitude. Um, and then shoring up, as I mentioned, uh, branding on city communications and uh, VT alerts and then other ongoing activities. Um, so overall, we're planning to have the majority of these items implemented by the one-year anniversary of the flood, um, which also um, timely coincides with the beginning of the fiscal year when many things will change, as we know, because of the budget. Um, and so with that, I will close and uh, welcome questions. Thanks, Evelyn. Any questions or thoughts? Adrian. <laughs> These have questions in my mind. Um, so there's two things. Thank you so much for that. That was super duper helpful to understand kind of the big picture. Um, just one question, what, there's two questions. The first one is um, in your individual action assessment, you talked about uh, formerly known as, what I know it as community action networks. Mm -hmm. So was that like gonna be like a thing, I don't even know who like came up with CAN, but that was part of like the individual action. Like, yeah, is... yeah. so so that is so in in this context, what I was okay. um, specifically Question. referring referring to is individual staff. Action. Oh, so, okay, yeah, okay, not, sorry, I got that. Confused. That's okay. Okay, that is also a like organizing public involvement is we're we're working on that through the volunteer okay. coordinate coordination management um, system. Thank you. I yeah, I got that confused but still um okay. the other thing I was thinking about um is brought back so many memories <laughs> good and bad um but we I live up off um Deerfield and I was just thinking my husband works at the hospital and we have another doctor up there and they were leaving at five o'clock in the morning to go to work and they couldn't go to the hospital to perform their you know duties of working in a hospital because we realized at that moment we were on an island. Like we went down Portal Road, it was completely closed. We went up Middlesex, it was completely closed. So we were landlocked. And so when you were talking about setting up those emergency like locations ahead of time, like I wonder if, you know, you've done an assessment of the city of those locations that are completely, like what if someone had a medical emergency, there would be no, there's no way to get, there was no way to get to our neighborhood. Um, that's a lot of people up there. So I'm just thinking we weren't able to get out, but what happens if someone needed to get in? <laughs> so I don't know if that was thought of. I was just thinking about it. Yeah. So that, I mean, that is tricky because we only have so many, you know, we emergency vehicles too. We can't put them everywhere. Um, the main concern was making sure they were on either side of the bridges, the, the river, so that both sides could be or responded to. Um, some of our vehicle, some of our vehicles can get through some of that water that a passenger car can't. Um, so we were able to get to some people who couldn't otherwise get help. I mean, you know, we don't like to put our vehicles at risk either, but um, depending on how deep 
the water and some of them some of the bigger vehicles can get through but it is absolutely you know short of having an ambulance in every sector yeah. of you know every neighborhood in town right um it, it, it right that's one of the things that happens so I'm wondering, right? So if you had those like community action networks that had a doc, like there's a doctor that lives in our neighborhood, my husband's mm -hmm. a nurse, like if you tapped into those in like structures of people that live in those neighborhoods, mm -hmm. it part of your emergency response because you couldn't send an ambulance up there. Like I don't know if that's the city's responsibility or coordination with your partners, but that's like a an opportunity, right. I think. Yeah, that, that's a long conversation yeah. about. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what did and didn't work with the CAN networks. Oh, so. okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, okay. there was, a, yeah, there was a, yeah. Okay. Lauren. It's okay. I, I, but I do think separate from CAN as an entity to organize that, I think one of the things that I'm excited about um, for the emergency response kind of effort that the commission is doing in partnership with the city is, you know, the city has these immense responsibilities and so much of it is just happening out of sight of the public. Like people have no idea what's even happening. And part of what the goal of the commission is to be rounding that out and be thinking about, okay, what are residents doing? And do they have information about what to do? Um, what do businesses, things that are outside of the responsibility of the city, but of course we all care and we all want to be supporting each other, but it's also just there's only so much staff capacity and, and all of that. So I think like being able to think through that kind of question of like, oh, are there like networks we could create that could help, um, you know, supplement the city through individual actions or something? I think that's the kind of question that, you know, in the emergency response plan that's looking beyond city responsibilities, but to more like a community-wide effort and collaboration is I create some, I think, exciting opportunities to see how we could be creative in that. Anybody else? Thanks, Evelyn. Thank you. Next up, see Jack stipends. Um, the chair of the community. I, I see she is on here. So I Maybe the best to speak this, and I can certainly back her up. Okay. She was. Oh, there she goes. All right. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I was doing some other work on my computer, but I did hear my name. So are we at the <laughs> <laughs> been glued to the meeting all night? Come on. <laughs> um. Yeah, no, I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Um, but yeah, so um, I think yeah, as you all know, um, we have. So the, would you start by introducing yourself for yeah. folks who are watching? Thanks. Yeah, I'm Shana Casper. I'm I live on Kent Street in Montpelier. I your pronouns. I'm the um uh the chair of the um see, and now I don't even have it pulled up here. Sorry, of CJAC, the Social Economic Justice Advisory Committee. Um, so uh. About two and a half years ago, we passed the um, the um, uh, uh, the stipend process um, in in uh, twenty twenty one, um, and we're able to give fifty dollars stipends per meeting for um, participants of boards, committees, and commissions um, to support with um any any indirect expenses needed to have volunteers be able to participate in different boards committees and commissions and um we have not come close to the amount of funds that we were put into these stipends so we had thirty thousand dollars budgeted um the last time we got the kind of download from the city it was only about six thousand dollars it was around the end of the year so um i know we only have the stipends for a few more months from january you know from and from april until um, July. Um, and there has been a request for almost a year now of having expanding those discretionary stipends to include um, people who are not part of just boards, committees, and commissions, but to include other groups on uh, as needed basis from different groups or um, uh, participations who are ineligible due to not being appointed elected um, to a board committee or commission. 
Um, so such as the Community Justice Center volunteers to participate in the restorative justice circles. Um, and then for other kind of more one-time, not ongoing participatory processes. Um, so like this could include things like Country Club Load Property or the Flood Recovery and Resilience Property we've been talking about tonight. So um, really wanting to ensure that there's equitable participation and that there is um, ability for people to be able to participate um, as needed into the, in these different committees um, or processes, I should say. So um, the proposal is that there be a written proposal submitted by city staff um, or by a committee board or commission with kind of the description of the need and the maximum budget for the process. Um, and if it's a one-time process, there'd be a report back and if it's an ongoing volunteer engagement to be submitted annually. Again, we know this is only going on for two more months, um, but it would be you know, a meaningful impact for um, if there are any participation processes that would need this, as well as um, for the um, CJC, which has requested this for, for quite some time now. So apologies for being slow on the uptake here, but- um, Not at all. We know if you have um, any questions. Thank you. I, I was curious, I'm sure other people may have some questions, but I, I was curious about uh, who you were he hearing from, not by name necessarily, but what what was the- The impetus of this? What was the barrier to uh, to for people who are already who have already gone ahead and gotten appointed to a board or commission? Why was it seen as so burdensome to uh, to submit uh, reimbursement uh, requests? So this proposal in particular is not for existing committees, boards, and commissions. This is just for expanding it to um, yeah more one time things. I think for the for up for the process having people um, submit, and that wasn't necessarily the submission process, but for the follow through and getting the funds in return, I think it often took a couple of emails um, and kind of proactive work by the chair um, to make sure that we know who's going, you know, as a chair to be able to submit the, you know, when, when it is a warned meeting and it is kind of an official meeting to submit the um, kind of required paperwork. So I think there has been a little bit more training and, and work by the city to make that happen, but um, that it did prove to be too onerous for some participants. And what do you anticipate the outcome of this would be? Well, uh, we can set aside the, the uh, Community Justice Center because that's a formal formal body and people do, you know, have presumably volunteered and they're on a list and they go to these meetings and participate. But uh, for people who are not appointed to, uh, to be on a com state city committee or uh, body, what would you anticipate uh, the process and outcome would be? Yeah, I think we were mostly talking about this, um, or kind of the idea initially came up with the um, Country Club Lo Country Club Club Road Elk Club project, and with um, you know the the consultants there, they're working with CJAC to try to get more um, diverse participation in that um, in that process. And um, one of the things we identified was, hey, we have this stipend process with the intent purposes of, of trying to get more, more diverse participation. So of getting renters, getting um, youth, getting, you know, different types of, of um, communities that would likely want to participate in this process, but who may not be otherwise like motivated to be able to attend these kind of early on discussions. Um, and so of, of working with her kind of that kind of initially sparked the conversation. Um, and then I think, yeah, just having participated in a lot of the, the flood, you know, per processes seeing, you know, that they're, they're not being, not having childcare participate, you know, at those events of, you know, talking to some members of, of, um, having to leave early and not being able to participate in the breakout groups and things like that, um, because of the time of different events and, while the stipend's obviously not uh, like a structural systemic change, it's it's a it's a, it's intended to to ease some of those burdens. Um, and so 
yeah, so the process would be if you're going to be organizing, you know, something like a public hearing or, you know, a more of a one-time, one-off event or, um, or, or yeah, public process where you're really wanting to intentionally recruit, um, yeah, diverse constituents um, in the city to be able to come to the city saying, you know, we want to offer these stipends. We anticipate they're, you know, up to a hundred people, five thousand dollar max, um, and uh, you know, for you know, for example, and um, being able to have forms to have people fill out to be able to get that stipend, being able to advertise the stipends, um, and then it would just be um, going through the same um, kind of form process, um, participation, um, uh, check essentially from whoever's uh, involved in it to submit it afterwards. Um, and then the kind of just lost your audio and your connection. Is it my connection or? Yeah. I, yeah. I hear it in my headphones. Um, yeah, sure. I don't know if you can hear what I can't hear what you're saying at the moment. Give me a thumbs up if you heard that. Okay, thank you. We're working on it. Sorry. My, my Zoom is being weird too. Oh. Is restarting the internet again? Or? So can't hear you. Oh, bummer. Okay. So she's going through your headphones. The signal just the main crash there. Can you guys hear me now? No. Well, you know, I just saw a, a message that the city council chambers is now the host. So maybe. Whatever was the host. I keep seeing it flash to different hosts in the corner. You can hear me now? I hear you now, yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Wasn't you as our Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> keeps keeps flashing in the corner. Who's who's the host? Yep. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, again, this is this is really um you know, there's only a couple of months left in this budget cycle. There's not a budget for any stipends for next year. I think this would essentially be a trial in case anyone wants to do it. And that hopefully when we'll get the budget in the future, we'd be able to um, have stipends for not just uh, kind of ongoing boards and committees, but for more one-time events um, as well. Um, Carrie, then Adrian. Oh. Well, I just wanted to... Um just address the process question a little bit more that um, we wanted to try to keep this as simple as possible so that we would be using basically the same process for getting stipends out to people, but that the city council could approve on a one-time basis that it could be used for a particular event or a particular circumstance. So someone would have to come to city council and say, we would like the stipends for such and such a circumstance with, as Shana was saying, an estimate of how much it would be. And so city council could approve something very specific. So it's not just kind of throwing open the doors to, we're gonna have a public forum where we expect 300 people and we're gonna pay them all $50, right? Like we wouldn't approve that, that's not practical, but some other version of that potentially. And that, that yes, this is only for a couple of months and we know that there aren't stipends for next year, but um, we're hoping to get something in place now with the idea that perhaps the stipends will come back in the future that this we're still hoping that this can prove to be a way to in, increase participation and to um you know try to pay people for their labor where we can in reasonable ways adrian um first of all thank you so much for this i think it's so important for our community to participate in civic engagement opportunities and be part of these boards and you know, I think time, energy, child care prohibits probably a huge majority of us from participating in these types of activities. But one of the things and I, I, one of the things I'm just, I don't know, administrative burdens is really um, kind of a thorn in my side. And so when I think about a stipend and, you know, the forms that you have to fill out, that's a barrier to participation. And so I don't know if there's other alternatives to consider that's not under the stipend header that provides, um, you know, fiscal, um, you know, 
I don't know, a fiscal, I don't know what, the, I'm trying to use a word that doesn't have legalities attached to it. Um, I'll just give you an example. When the way we got around in one of the organizations I worked at, stipends, because you do have to fill out your, um, what was it, your W-9 or something. Yeah. Um, you know, fill out your forms and give all your information, which is a lot of, it's a lot of time and energy. Um, and kind of to your point, we're not just going to hand out, you know, gift cards, but is there a way to make this process a lot easier without having to go through all those forms? Maybe having gift cards that, you know, are handed out in these meetings to those like pre-approved people so that at the end of the meeting, they do get like a gift card, um, or something that is not attached to the word stipend, which then requires all that paperwork. I'm just trying to think of ways to make this easier for people to still be reimbursed and, and be engaged in these processes because it's really just such a critical part of our community. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there as, as, as something to think about. Yeah, so Adrian, back in 2019, 2020, we hired consultants from Creative Discourse to, to do kind of a equity audit for the city. And that was how we were able to do that because we didn't have any type of stipend program. And that was kind of exactly what we were talking about here of like a one-time thing, coming to a focus group, participating in this process. Um, and we had gift cards um, for that, but it was like through this consultant. It wasn't through the city. Um, and I I don't know if we we considered that um, super deeply from, from the city's path, but that this stipend process is what they were doing in Essex. And um, we kind of copied a lot of their learn lessons learned and um, to try to make it as little less onerous as possible. But yeah, recognizing it as still filling out a W-9, which is a lot of paperwork for both the applicant and for the city. Lauren. Thanks. Um, yeah. And just, I mean, I think it, it still is an administrative burden. I mean, and we've seen the uptake. So there's definitely people taking advantage of it. It is, you know, allowing some people that I think would have not otherwise been able to participate, which is was the goal. Um, and, you know, but that makes more sense if you're talking about like someone who's signing up for a board that has monthly meetings or whatever, and like you sign up, you do your W9 once. I do think trying to think creatively if we did want to expand, which, I mean, I, I like the idea, like the goal of the, equity assessment, making this recommendation, it was much broader than just the boards and commissions. It was like all of our public processes. So, you know, I think like the country club road one's a great example. There were lots of conversations. How do we get different people? And, you know, if we'd been able to give out gift cards, we might've gotten different people to participate. So, I mean, I think, I think it, it's a good idea to, you know, given that we've got this like window, let's try some, try some things. Let's learn from it. Hopefully when we have a better fiscal year, we could reinstate a program. And I think, I mean, to me, I think like the CJAC budget to me should be more flexible and it should go to like, it can be used towards stipends and towards community participation. Like we could put some parameters around it, but I'd love to give, like allow for more like creativity and meeting needs um, with specific goals and, you know, things that report backs and stuff. But to me, I could see that as a future so that we can get more creative and look for more ways to engage people beyond just the boards and commissions. Anybody else have any thoughts? Uh, Carrie. So I, I'm going to make a motion that um, the stipend fund can be used at the discretion of the city council for any volunteer engagement on a one-time or ongoing basis. And that's just taken right out of the memo. Mm -hmm. Is there a second? <laughs> oh, yeah. Because you said immediately, effective immediately. When will I? So well, at the, the end of this fiscal year, the money will no longer okay. exist. Yeah. So it just like. I don't think that needs to be specified in the motion. No, I'm just like asking. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> any other discussion? Um, Bill, did you have any uh, discussion with uh, with Sarah or anything about whether whether we have problems 
not doing the W-9 or is was our assumption that we needed to do the W-9 as a legal uh, so requirement? I, I have not specifically about this. Um, I mean, we do process the stipends and Serena, you know, takes care of them. And so I, I think those that are getting them have done their W-9s. I don't think we would issue them without them. Um, but again, I think so far there have been people that are on boards. They're voluntary, so not everybody on a committee might take them, but those that sign up. And we have a process where their attendance is verified by the chair, and we issue, I think, monthly checks to folks. Um, so we'd, you know, we'd have to have a similar process in place for people between now and June 30th. Okay, are we ready to vote? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, we've adopted that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Saros. Thanks. Coming on. No, not at all. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for for coming. All right. Up to uh, Adrian Grant Committee. All right, well, thanks for adding this to you. Well, moving it from the agenda from last time, I'm excited to present this idea to the council. Um, if I was thinking at the beginning of today, I would have wrote down many, as many times we said, oh, well, you need funding. We are gonna apply for funding. We need funding for this. We need funding for that. It was probably a huge amount of, of opportunities. And so I was, I was thinking about our structure in Montpelier and our budget that we have, or the grand list that brings in money and all the programs that we have in our budget. Um, I was just wanted to propose this idea because when I was out in the community, people were telling me that I wrote federal grants as a professional. I want to give back to my city. I want to volunteer, but I need a very specific role. And so I heard this a couple times and it got me thinking the city staff has, you know, a finite amount of resources. As we know, they're already overworked, they're at capacity, um, but we do need to bring in more money. Um, it is a fact. And so how do we do that? You know, we can't just go build houses tomorrow and expand our grand list. And so one of the ways that I, I propose that we bring in some more money or thinking about bringing in more money and I've done this professionally, is put together a committee um, that works with the city to identify the priorities. So what is on the budget that could be funded through a grant? And we work together um, in collaboration to identify and prioritize those opportunities with this committee. And this committee goes out and researches, are there, is there funding for these programs, yes or no? Um, they come back to the council and say, we have found all these grants that align to the programs that you all want to fund or that are currently being funded through your budget. And we get presentations. So it's not done in a vacuum. It's not done behind the scenes. It's really a transparent process that I'm proposing and that this group works in coordination with the city to apply for funds. I proposed in my um, memo that we're looking for grants that are a million dollars or more. I'm not interested in many grants at this point. I'm, I'm thinking big grants, big, big grants to kind of offset our budget so that we can reinvest in our infrastructure or bigger projects that kind of relieve our um, programmatic, um, you know, pieces that are in our budget. So bringing in some big money, it could be a goal of, you know, four or five um, funding applications over one fiscal year. Um, but really thinking about how do we utilize our community partners that want to volunteer, that have the expertise, that have the time and dedication to work on a very specific committee that writes federal grants, that you know works on state grants, that works for philanthropic, um, writes philanthropic grants, um, that brings in additional monies to support our programs. Um, and that is what I'm proposing um, as a new grant committee. And I'm, there's way more details in here, but I'm just losing my voice. So if there's any specific questions, I'm more than happy to entertain them. Well, Bill, I'll start out by asking, how, how do you see this working with the city administration? The, the way Adrian has proposed it, I think it would work 
well. Um, you know, when you first mentioned a grant committee, our our folks had, um, I think, some PTSD about, you know, chasing around $500 grants and, you know, a, a gazillion applications and all those kind of things. But then when she gave me the outline and basically said, we're looking for a million dollars or more, I think the idea of sort of meeting with everyone saying, these are our major needs, and then sending some folks off to go looking for them, um, we're actually enthusiastic, you know, would be, we think it would work great. Anybody have any other thoughts? We appreciate people's willingness to do it. Lauren. Just, just one idea would be like, we stand this up and just knowing that we have like all of these boards and commissions that also have a lot of ideas, connections, like Chris earlier was talking about, you know, there's someone who happens to work for Efficiency Vermont, who's on the energy committee now, who has connected us to a bunch of grants that we didn't even know existed. And so I just like mining these other committees too, for connections, ideas, resources that they might know about just is something that this committee could help do. <laughs> so do you want to make a motion? I, I like the idea. I just, I just wanted to support it. I think it makes, I think it makes sense. I think we have a lot of people who would be interested in helping. I've heard the same kind of thing you've heard from people who used to do it for a living. So, mm -hmm. so is there a motion to create this committee? That's, I think that's the next step. I move we create a grant committee. <laughs> Second that. All right, and and the outline of how the next steps are in the memo. So, any further discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Any opposed? Okay, great. Advertise. Yep. I am not aware of any other business, so we're to council reports. Start with the you're in this time. Pass. Forward to one. Tim. Pass on, I won't pass, but I'll say the eclipse was really cool in Montpelier, and I really thought we had done an over uh, effort to be ready for it. And I, after it was over, we didn't. We, I think the city staff had set everything up, did a great job. Trash cans, portalettes, you know, gearing up for the crowds because they came and it was really good. So thank you. So, okay. um, mayor's report, I don't have much, but also the eclipse. I thought that you know, even having seen partial eclipses before, came right through Montpelier. I just thought it was just a magical day. I, the city uh, employees did a great job in managing the expected crowd. Um, you all saw that very nice email I got from someone praising the city for doing this. And I've heard of other people saying that it was great to come to our city and see what we've got going on and they will be back. Um, I, I briefly toyed with the idea of issuing a mayoral proclamation, uh, ordering the sun to, uh, to return after a brief period of uh, withholding its uh, light and but it came back even without doing it. So uh, a successful, uh, successful day and uh, good job, everybody. Clerk's report. Don't want to talk about the abatement process? You don't have to. <laughs> I don't, I'm PTSD from that process. I don't know. Okay, I'm... well, well, I'll just mention something. <laughs> uh, we, we just had our last, uh, of a long series of uh, Board of Abatement uh, meetings, and there will be information forthcoming about the total value of abatements that were granted. But uh, but it was it was a lot of members of the uh, council and Board of Abatement put in a lot of work, and uh, and we got all the abatements uh, handled within the uh, statutory uh, timeline and. So I'll express my appreciation for everyone who did all that work to to get us to this point. And yeah, that was great. 
and it's above and beyond the call of uh, what one would expect your all's duties to be um, over the last several months. So thank you for hanging in with it all. Bill. Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll step up for the city clerk and remind everybody there's an election on April 30th for the school budget. <laughs> I get you back, bud. Um, so there is this, uh, so the school budget and early voting is starting. Uh, appreciate the comments about the eclipse. There was a lot of um, work done, and I certainly would be remiss if we didn't include Montpelier Alive. Uh, they actually, Katie came to me last fall and she said, you know, we got this eclipse and people tell, you know, they say people are going to come for this. And I was like, what? People, you know, and she's like, yeah, they say like thousands. And we were both like, really? That seems a lot. But she was right. And so she got us uh, going. So uh, thanks to them and all the other community partners and certainly our city staff uh, who did everything. And, you know, the merchants and the people who came were just really kind and wonderful. And even people stuck in traffic were great. So it's a good day, good for day for all. And if you did issue a pro proclamation, it must have been for the only the third sunny day on April 8th in the last hundred years. So, <laughs> um, so that was well done. Um, we will be coming at hopefully the next meeting, but certainly one of the meetings in May with a proposed uh, a budget adjustment for the use of the 825,000. We actually hope to have it for tonight, but we're still working out our recommendations internally. You can imagine how that goes. Just like the cuts <laughs> in the fall, <laughs> the ad backs. Um, and most importantly of all, in two weeks from tonight, we'll be having our retreat, uh, council retreat at 5.30 at the activity Senior Activity Center. We will have food. Jen Nauer, K-N-A-U-E-R, uh, is our facilitator. She should have reached out to all of you. And she asked me to remind you all to get back to her because if there are specific things that you would like to talk about, like prioritizing strategic plan or whatever they might be, then she can plan for that. So, uh, and she'll be sending out a draft agenda, uh, but it, she, you know, Kelly and I have been talking with her, but we were like, it's, you know, it's really gotta be what the council wants to talk about. So what they hope to get out. So she is eagerly looking at a camera. I don't know whether she wanted phone calls or, um, or emails, but whatever, whatever she asked for, please get back to her because it will just make us all have a better evening and a better process that means something. Um, so that's all I have. All right, and with that, oh, actually, I did one. Okay, I I just say thank you again to the council for rescheduling these two meetings in April. Um, next week is school vacation week. I know some of us will be away. But the last one you scheduled was because we attended a conference in Boston, uh, ICMA Regional Conference, and both Kelly and I went. And it was all about um, AI, artificial intelligence. And, you know, I was kind of like, really? They're going to give us two and a half days on this? And, you know, what I realized at least was I, I learned, you know, I, I didn't know what I didn't know. And the uses that are, are happening in municipal government, both positive and negative, um, are really overwhelming. And it was one of the bo the best content conferences I think either of us have gone to in a long time. Um, so it was really great that we could do that. And uh, while we were in a session, Kelly banged out an RFP and a, and a uh, Country Club Road use policy just using AI. So, um, <laughs> so what? Dog park, oh, could be dog park. Yeah, that too. That's next. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to acknowledge that you did move your April meeting so that we could accommodate these things. And I wanted to make sure to give you feedback. First of all, thank you. And second of all, it was really worth it. So we uh, have a lot of ideas and productive, productive ideas we hope we can bring to the city. So that, now I'm done. Great, thank you. And <laughs> as a, we are, you are. <laughs> and as of 1018, we are adjourned. Thank you all.